So how's it feel to to come home after a big a big win on a it UFC pay per view event? It was uh, busy. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, we because uh, it got pushed back. So I made that the grappling event I was telling you about mm-hmm. is this coming weekend here in town. Mm-hmm. But I made it. I was like, oh, it'll be a month after my fight, and then uh, it was three weeks, and then it was like <laughs> I had been gone for like uh, over eight weeks, probably closer to ten from home. Like I, I would come back on weekends and Mondays, I would spend in town. Mm-hmm. So, like, I had a big pile of stuff that I had to take care of. And I was like, let me take care of all the stuff I've been neglecting forever. Uh, so uh, it was busy. I just – I haven't stopped. I, and then uh, I had a buddy fight in a ran combat in mm-hmm. Atlantic City. So uh, I went up to try to help our coach out because he had uh, – Ryan Barbarina fights tomorrow in London. So he had to nice. get back to work with him. I'm like, I will go to Atlantic City and corner, you know, our buddy, make sure he has someone there. And uh, so it was right back to travel. It was like – it was just – it's been chaos. <laughs> so it's like a – you know, it, it must be such a sigh of relief to like get the win, and then yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it's great. I do mean, you have so much stuff that piles up during fight camp because it sounds like you got a lot going on. Yeah, I mean, nothing like, like just with with running the event. You know, it's the only thing I really do outside of fighting, other than you know I, uh-huh. I teach some classes here and there. But uh, that was a big one because it's only our second one, so we're still getting our feet wet and figuring out this whole thing. Um, gotcha. And I'm the one man show, so like getting the sponsors, you oh, know, ma- matchmaking, all that. So like, I was on the plane ride home the next day. Uh, and I bought the Wi-Fi splurge because I won the splurge, bonus. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I was like answering all the emails and stuff. And people were like messaging me back and being like, oh, wow, can you tell Joe congrats? And I was like, it's me. Like, <laughs> like, like we don't have yeah. staff. So, uh, yeah, just that, you know, and that being away from from the family and stuff. But uh, just getting back, I got a bunch of house projects I had to tackle now. But uh, oh, yeah. right back to training too. So just yeah. like trying to stay right with it. Do you have an idea of what, when your next fight will be? I don't. So uh, – we're having a baby in July, so ideally June at the latest, or if not, then maybe like two months following, you know, just so I can like be there. Are you accounting um, for the lack of sleep that will happen? Yeah. Or do you have a I mean, I fought Jim Miller on like no sleep because yeah. we, we had a seven-month-old, and she co-slept. So my wife in the hospital, they were like, are you going to want to put her in the bassinet and then, you know, all that and get her out to feed? And she held her the entire time, and I looked at her and I was like, this is great. Like, I love this too, but like. I guarantee we're going to have that I told you so moment where you're like, I shouldn't have done this. And she's like, oh, shut up. Probably so. But And then she didn't sleep in a crib or a bassinet the entire time. She just slept in my wife's Mm -hmm. arms for like seven months. So when I got the Miller fight, I was like, this is working. So don't try to sleep train her right now because like she would just wake up and my wife would be right there so she could just feed or whatever she had to do. Right. And uh, But still, like just the tossing and turning, I'm like, we did not sleep at all. So (laughs) like this guy knew that I haven't slept in like – the entire camp. <laughs> well, you won that fight. So yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what was that experience like, just learning that you were going to fight Jim Miller, who I imagine you've probably watched growing up yeah. uh, in the UFC? One of my all-time favorites. And then now, yeah. even more so, I've shared the cage with him, you know? But uh, yeah. I'm from New Jersey. So him and Dan, people mm-hmm. forget about Dan Miller. Dan Miller might have been better than Jim. Like, he was great. He, they yeah. were great fighters. Um, they were kind of like the pride of New Jersey before Frankie Edgar was the guy, you know? So uh those three are kind of like my all-time, some of my all-time favorites. But yeah, it was it was wild because uh, my manager mentioned it and was like, what do you think about this? But it was like two weeks notice. And I was like, well, I don't really want to fight anybody in two weeks, let alone right. Jim Miller. But if we can get a month, I'll do it. And then it went away and then he came back with a full cam for it. And I was like, mm-hmm. dude, 100%. Uh, but I said, every time I hear, because uh, I, I like the song too, it's on like our workout playlist. Every time I hear Bad Moon Rising, uh-huh. uh, I looked up, I'll look up at a buddy and be like, it was at this moment I was like, how did I get here? Like, maybe I made some bad mistakes in life because, like, <laughs> he walked out and was, like, just staring at me. And oh I was boy. like, it's one of my childhood heroes. Like, he was just – I'm like, I have to fight this guy, and he is terrifying. But uh, it was great. It worked out. So He's your hero, but you're going to punch him in the face. Yeah, then. yeah. I mean, I'm going to give him the best fight I can, you know. <laughs> only only in mixed martial arts mm-hmm. is, is that ever the case. For sure. For sure. <laughs> what, what's the process like uh, for maybe people that don't know just of – when you find out who you're going to fight, like it sounds kind of chaotic to me. It sounds like yeah. you don't really know until mm-hmm. you know. And then it's, you know, you're in a series of working yeah. with people's timing and management that probably wants certain people to fight certain people. Like what? Is it yeah. just chaos or what? Yeah. I mean, I, we always joke like my, my head coach, Jeff mm-hmm. Jimmo up in Charlotte, he always says like we're in the business of saying yes. Because like it's it's kind of an understood, mm-hmm. like especially if you're like like I'm not anybody, you know. So it's like. You get the name, and they say, "What do you think about this?" But Joe, you are somebody. Come yeah, well, yeah. Not only anybody Come on, with you power. You beat Jim Miller yeah, yeah, yeah. in the UFC. That's a pretty big deal. Plus, <laughs> I appreciate that. Plus, you've really—I mean, looking at what you've done, your performances over the last 
I mean, even you only have one loss in the last what four years or something yeah. like that. Yeah, and that was a split, split. decision. Yeah. Which that's the worst one. It was which, easier to get knocked out on the regional scene than it was <laughs> to lose a split decision. You're like, oh. right, right. One more takedown, you know. But so, uh, man, you're 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 racking yeah, up, man. But you're but you know, together. it's like we don't get any pull, you know. So yeah. it's like. I'd imagine the top five guys get to be like, mm -hmm. no, I'm not going to fight him. I'll, I'll do it on my timetable. Like, we're in yeah. the business of saying yes. They pass a long name, you're going to say mm -hmm. yes. But yeah, and that's the thing is the timing depends on all of it because there's been times where, you know, I've gotten the call and it's six and a half weeks away and you're like, oh, cool, I'm in camp yesterday. Like, right. we got to get, like, I, I literally, uh, when I fought in last June, I fought Alex Da Silva and, uh, it was six and a half weeks notice, I think, which is still, you know, it's plenty of time to get ready. We're always training really hard. So it's just a peaking process. But I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, it's Wednesday. I need to spar like tonight. And like I had to find who was available. So I ended up having <laughs> to spar three rounds with Jamie Pickett, who's gigantic, you know? Yeah. Like, you know, can you give me three straight rounds? Like, yeah, of course. So I'm like, it was just like, we got to go right now, you know? Um, but then there's been times where I get four months notice, you know? So mm -hmm. that was this last one we had forever. I think it was 16 weeks or 17 wow. weeks. Yeah, so I was up there uh, in Charlotte training with my buddy, Scott Holtzman. And he was getting ready for, uh, he was fighting Clay Guida. And uh, okay. so I was just doing some stuff alongside him. And we had like a plyometric workout and he was going to do a finisher on the air die. And I was like, well, you know, Jeff doesn't want me doing too much of this stuff right now because we're not peaking or like getting in that like fight, fight shape. Right. But I'll do it as like a uh, moral support. I'll, I'll go alongside you. And we got done and I got the fight. I was like, well, I'm glad I did that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, then it's hard not to go crazy, you know, because you have right. to keep following the process. Like if you're in an aerobic phase, say, and you're doing a lot of long running and long swimming, biking, what have you it's hard to not want to just get on the air nine and pound out sprints right. to feel ready. You know, like it's hard to follow the process. So, uh, and then on the opposite is, is the shorter notice. You don't want to let your imagination run wild and tell you you're not in shape. Cause you know, with us, we right. train all year long. So, um, yeah, it's a weird process. And then for me, whenever I get the name, they always seem, no matter who it is, you could put a, a, a 12 year old kid across the cage. Uh, the first time we hear that name, they're going to seem unbeatable. Like, you watch it and you have like the adrenaline and the mm -hmm. and the nerves and the just you just got this name 10 minutes ago and then I'll watch it back halfway through camp and you're like yeah I'm prepared to fight this guy like I can I can do what he can do like yeah he's very good maybe he can beat me but it's not I'm not going to get you know I'm not it's not not competitive you know what mm -hmm. I mean like I can beat this guy as much as he can beat me um it almost takes away all the emotion out of it so yeah. people always laugh like I've had a couple teammates be like I hate training with you the day of or the day after you found out you have a fight because like you have all this <laughs> adrenaline and you just go nuts. I'm like, I know I can't help it, but uh, yeah, it's a crazy process. It well, really, really is. That's a, that's a perfect segue into a couple things. One, people might ask me, Nick, your background is in intelligence. Like what, <laughs> why are you talking to a UFC fighter, a mixed martial arts artist? I must have trouble saying that word, <laughs> mixed martial artist. <laughs> but um, you know, why, why are you talking to them? Well, to me, I see a lot of parallels between the way the intelligence uh, apparatus works versus um, sports competition. You know, yeah. one thing is for sure is you have to go in with some type of strategy. Um, what's what's that process like for, you know, coming up with a strategy to fight somebody? You mentioned, you know, you're obviously at the point now where most of the people you fight, you're probably going to have a lot of video on. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me about that? Like, how, do, how does the strategy go into play? And, like, who, who are the key players yeah. in your strategic um Game plan. Yeah, I think there's a lot of crossover, you know what I mean, to, in, into anything mm -hmm. that ha requires a lot of preparation and thought, you know, because I think uh, the big thing that I think maybe people have kind of forgotten over time or just don't know because, you know, the flash sells. So they don't really, on these countdown yeah. shows, they're telling the dramatic story. They're not telling the day in, day out story of all the preparation, yeah. you know. It's, uh, I would say it's probably one of the most, you know, like every box check type of sports, you know, right. even more than... The other ones where you can rely on your teammates and stuff, you know, you watch The Last Dance. I was just rewatching it. That's why I'm thinking about it. But, like, Rodman goes away for three days to Las Vegas partying. Like, you can never do that in a fight. No. You know, like, no. uh, it's only you. So, like, it really is almost a scientific method to it. And then the part that becomes, like, art, I would say, is the actual, like, sparring and fight because you've done all the prep, but now you've actually got to implement it. And that's where you get kind of creative, you know. So, I think right. it really – with the right athletes, you know. So, I, I think it, there's a lot of carryover. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got to set the, not only the game plan, but I think more so like the game plan for the training camp, you know, because mm -hmm. like I just said with a the fight, there's so many X factors, there's so many ways to lose. And, you know, you have to be able to adapt on the fly. So I think like we always say like we have a template, not a game plan. So, you know, we have our bullet points and then yeah. I get to fill in the gaps. That's that's on me to, to build those habits. And, uh, but the training camp, I think that is huge. You know, um, this one, especially, I mean, always, I've always been like a prepper, you know, like everything I want to, 
almost control too much. And uh, my coach, Jeff Jimmo, we were talking about it all camp was like front end preparation is like we do everything on the front end and the back end has to take care of itself, you know, right. and the back end being the fight. So, or the weight cut and all that stuff. So, um, how much weight do you cut? I mean, you look like you're yeah, pretty like, big for a, for yeah. a lightweight. <laughs> yeah. I used to be really, like, people would tell me I should cut the featherweight what? and I was only like 22 and 23. And I'd be like, guys, like I'm not even close to done growing. I mean, vertically I was, but, uh, right. you know, I'm like, I'm going to, you know, get denser and stuff. And now it's like, yeah, the last one, I think I cut, uh, just of water was like maybe like 12 and a half, 13 okay. the night before the weigh in. And then, uh, Probably about 20, 25 from start to finish as far as like the diet and all mm. that stuff. But uh, yeah, I'll probably get up to like 178 out of camp, 176. Wow. Um, there's a lot, guys a lot bigger, you know, but yeah, uh, yeah. I like where I'm at. I feel healthy. But uh, it's a, e even the weight cut is, seems like a, it's a fine balance. Yeah. You know, it's, there's strategy that goes into that too because. For sure. And that's the thing is like, you can't stay on weight all year. You know, right. like that would be so unhealthy and, and, you'd be at such a disadvantage. You know, everybody mm -hmm. else is going to be cutting weight. And it's the same thing with the training, like with the preparation. Like we used to be, I used to be very, okay, I don't want to lose this shape that I have. So I've got to hit these red line conditionings. Mm -hmm. I'm on the air nine all year, running hill sprints all year, this and that. And you go, oh, I never actually developed anything. I'm just like, you're just kind of coasting in this constantly. CNS is fried, your central nervous system. Right. Uh, hard sparring all the time. And you're like, oh, I'm actually never improving, you know? So it, it, I think it is like anything else, like maybe probably tech, you know, like you have to get all your stuff prepped first. You have to have a plan, a blueprint. And that's where I kind of, uh, I think with anything, any kind of like any kind of team or mm -hmm. leadership or anything is like knowing when to delegate. So listening to the coaching now is, is going through phases, you know, so we're out of, we're right out of the fight. We got to build back. We're back in an aerobic phase. So yeah, it, maybe it doesn't feel like as difficult as running hill sprints, but I'm back to like long runs and mm -hmm. long bikes and uh, rowing and stuff like that. And then the, you know, lifting is very monotonous. It's very boring. And right. in the past, I would have been like, no, I got to be doing these crazy circuits. You're like, yeah, but you never developed your strength or your power or your aerobic base, you know, so stuff like that. And then we'll kind of follow the phases. And that's what I did this time. I was like, man, we're, we're, we're six weeks out. We haven't done those crazy throw up type workouts yet. And then I'm like, how's it going to feel when we throw them in? And I was like, oh, I feel better than ever. Oh, I followed the process. Yeah, like there's an actual blueprint gotcha. to this. Same thing with the diet. You know, mm -hmm. uh, my buddy Scott gave me a thing, uh, some some information. He had done some testing um, with Andy Galpin, who's like, mm -hmm. you know, very, very big in the sports science scene. I know that's who uh, Huberman gets a lot of his stuff from. And he did a lot of testing. And his, of course, was different than me because we have different, you know, genetic makeups and all that. But just the importance of the – the nutrition, you know, I always, same thing. I always ate healthy, but it was just to eat healthy. It was like, well, I'm not really thinking about the performance. Like, what am I eating before I train and all that? And uh, same with the supplementation and the rest mm -hmm. and just stuff to even, you know, foolish stuff like breathing. You know, you go, okay, <laughs> we just did a, you know, an hour hard wrestling we're going to do today. And you're like, and then I get in my car and go home. You're like, oh, yeah, I never downregulated. Like, I never, I never got in that phase where you come back to neutral and then, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that. And you're like, man, like. I was so much recharged for my second session of the day. So just stuff like that, learning the process and just, uh, you know, I guess having the the humility or the curiosity to to reach out to people who are smarter than you, you know, and that's been a huge help for me the last probably year or so more than ever. What I think is cool, just having watched the sport for so many years, is just watching this evolution of the sport. You know, back in the day when it first came out, we were talking Hoist Gracie days, things like <laughs> that, um, you know, fighters – they would just come in there all out of shape, you know. Like, I remember this guy Tank Abbott. You remember this yeah, guy? Oh yeah, <laughs> he come oh, yeah. he come and knock people out. Uh, he was like Roy right. Nelson before Roy Nelson, exactly. You know? But this guy wasn't in shape. No, and and no. he wouldn't he wouldn't even be able to walk into the cage today because yeah. because of it. Well, even like I was watching some of the. Uh, do you remember the All Access show they would do? Mm -hmm. They only did a couple yeah. episodes. But yeah. in this last camp, I was really bored because I, I was away from the family, I had nothing to do, and I was watching like the Tito one and the you know, like. Gosh, everyone thought Tito was so ahead of the curve. And he was at the time. But you're like, mm -hmm. he was just hard sparring every day. They never worked on any specific technique. Like, they're just like, his secret to cardio was like, yeah, I run at elevation and I don't take caffeine. You're like, what? <laughs> like, that's a great ergogenic gate. Like, it was just so funny. But back then he was ahead of the right. curve. You're like, and that was only, you know what, 12, 15 years ago. And, that, and now it's, now it's how much of it is following the science. Yeah. Right? I think it's got to be that yeah. fine line because like we talked about, like, it is scientific, but there's also that like art 
Mm -hmm. creativity aspect and and chaos. It's an X factor. So I think it's a fine line because you get the guys that say smarter, not harder. And like, uh, you know, Chael always says, like, that's the beginning of the end of a career. And I kind of agree. But if you use smarter and harder. Yeah. Yeah. He always says that. He's like, yeah, smarter, not harder is what somebody Mm -hmm. says when they're like, it can't go hard anymore and they're probably time to be done, you know. But there's also that time where it's like, you know, it is harder sometimes to do the right thing, you know, mm-hmm. to to take the, the rest time instead of doing that extra session to appease your doubt, you know, like, so, uh, yeah, I think that's a lot of it. I really, really do. Are, are you the type of person that, um, when it's, when it's fight day, are you, are you the type of person that's just aching to get in there and get it done or, or are you more reserved you know, uh, I, I believe George St. Pierre used to say he was afraid every time, and, which <laughs> yeah. is f- perfectly reasonable. Yeah. Um, you know, what, what's what's your mentality on that day of and you're getting ready? You know, you got Bruce Buffer yeah. there <laughs> getting ready to call your name. Like, yep. what, what is that? The first time with, with, with Buffer was like being on the top of the roller coaster, not looking over the edge. Like, I was like, I'm just not going to look at him because, like, I don't even want to acknowledge that this is a big mug in my debut. I'm like, I don't even want to acknowledge yeah. how big of a moment this is in my life right now. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's crazy, you know? It's it's one of those things where uh, my coach actually said it really good this past time because it is so tempting to analyze and overanalyze how you're feeling. Right. A, it doesn't matter. Like, you're going to get in this cage and do something, right? Like, yeah. whether I feel great, nervous, not nervous enough, mm-hmm. But the other thing is, like, you'll look at the ones you won with, like, kind of a bias and be like, did I feel like this when I fought this guy? And then he said the <laughs> best thing on fight day this last time. He was like, look, it's one of the situations where, like, it ain't the same river and it's not the same man putting his foot in, you know? And I was like, yeah. that actually makes a lot of sense. But typically, um, I'm a nervous wreck once my eyes open in the morning. Just like, and I'm not like, I'm not scared to get in a fight with somebody. It's more the nerves about, uh, you know, Teddy Atlas says your imagination can run wild in the back room. Mm-hmm. But for me, it's not really in the back room. It's actually before we leave for the venue. Um, you're going, I can't even do, like I used to be like that with jujitsu matches. I would go out there and be like, mm-hmm. I hope I don't forget jujitsu. Like, <laughs> this is the only sport you've ever done. You right. do this all day. Um, just like your imagination run, runs wild, you know? So, uh, yeah, it's tough in the morning. I get up and I'm a nervous wreck. And then uh, typically we'll go eat. And it's like, I remember uh, the Contender Series specifically because that was like the biggest, that was make or, make or break for us. And uh, I remember kind of like that like step back moment where I felt like I was like not even in the conversation mm-hmm. and just looking at everybody at breakfast and being like, how are they eating right now? How can they even eat in a moment <laughs> like this? Like, I can't eat my stomach. They're just acting like nothing crazy is happening today. And I was like, oh yeah, they don't have to fight. Um, but then, so we'll eat and then we'll go do our shakeout. And that's for like a good reminder to get that adrenaline out, get that mm-hmm. emotion out. You feel good. You're like, oh, okay, I feel sharp. I have, it's fight day. I feel good, you know? Um, and then the way I always describe it is, you know, pre-COVID and uh, this last fight as well, my wife got to be there. So I feel like I know we could hear her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah she could awesome. hear her without Which the awesome. without the microphone. Um, yeah, it was great, but it was like one of those things where I'm like, okay, I feel like I'm extra vulnerable when my wife's there. Like I, I'm super not wimpy, but just like I'm just like very emotional. You know, like I can I'll tell yeah. her like I'm so nervous this night. I hope this doesn't happen. And then uh, as soon as we leave, we walk out the door, hug her goodbye. This time I kiss the baby goodbye. She's got the big old belly going, and. Uh, it's like a switch. I just feel good. Like, I'm like, okay, we're going to work. Like, and I didn't, you know, you get the, the nervous excitement, but there's no more of that, like crazy doubt running through your brain. Right. It feels like, I don't know if that's because you're with your team now and you just want to like, you know, mm-hmm. show them you're ready or what it is. But I feel like I go from like regular dorky everyday Joe to like performer Joe, who's like, you know, people will say like in the cage, like you look so calm this night. You're like, you have no idea what I was like an hour before that, you know? <laughs> um, but during the quarantine fights was tough because now you're locked in a room all week, you know, right. uh, with just your your guys, your three guys, and uh, everything's focused on the fight. That and if you can, you know, I put my Roku, so you're watching TV. But other than right. that, you're like, man. So the last one I had in quarantine, the way I described it was like everyone was walking. You know, we would always go for walks. It was a residence in. It was just like three buildings. So they have a parking lot and you can walk around the buildings. This is and, in uh, the contenders. This was uh no, this was during the uh, COVID. Oh, so during this the was, COVID. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So they they uh even for the pay per views and stuff, they used this residence in. It had three buildings, I think. And the uh, residence in, couldn't they step it up? Yeah, honestly, it's, t- they at least it's gonna sound him? crazy. <laughs> I would prefer it over any nice casino because okay. what okay. happened was it was apartment style. So mm-hmm. you would have a kitchen, a living room, and two rooms. And because they had to rent the entire thing, 
you got two of those, and you got a third room where you could work out and then cut your weight with a mat in it Were for you yourself. The same building that the with the people you're no, so they had on? a blue corner building and a uh, red corner. Okay. So it was right. like it was like ideal conditions. That's and it's, legit. It, it sounds yeah. super because I remember being like a uh, residents in and getting there and being like, this is like this is the fight hotel. This is perfect because mm-hmm. now we go back in the casinos. You go okay. You get one room with two beds. There's nothing. There's no fridge, microwave, nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had to do some hacks to get a fridge, and we had to buy a hot plate <laughs> to cook on. And then you got to get a room for your quarters for you know five or six days at a casino. You know, they don't cover that. And then the workout room, you got to be with everybody, and you got to fight over the mats and who get with there, what time. So it was actually really ideal. But uh, so we would walk. My coach likes to go for walks in the morning. I'd join him. And then you wouldn't see many people out there. And then by the night before the fight, I go, I was, I was FaceTime my wife. I go, it looks like everybody's getting the electric chair tomorrow. Because everyone was just walking with their head down, like, <laughs> what have I gotten myself into? And they'd have like one person with them, like putting their hand on their shoulder. I'm like, everyone looks like they're headed to death penalty tomorrow. Like, because it was just no outlet, you know? Yeah. So uh, that was a little different. That was uh, that was tough for sure. And then one of my fights during that time, uh, I was supposed to be like one of the first fights in the night, the prelims. And like five fights fell off for COVID and I got a call on my phone. It was like, Hey, don't get on the bus right now. We don't know when you're going, but you're not going for now till later. We'll tell you when. And then hung up <laughs> and I was just sitting there and I was like, what am I supposed to do now? Like, I'm terrified. Like, what am I, like, I don't even right. know what I'm fighting. Like you got the emotions running yeah, and they're so, just texting you saying, not yet. Yeah. Hold yeah. on, Joe. So it was actually a really valuable tool, man. The COVID fights were, it was just, it was like going on like, I mean, it was not like at all, but it was what I, like, if we were playing make-believe, it was like I was reading uh, Robert O'Neill's book, the guy that that took out Bin Laden, and uh, mm-hmm. I was like, okay, this is like playing make-believe Navy SEAL. Like, I feel like we just like got to this place, we're locked down, no one can see us, we do our job and go home, you know? Nothing even close to that, but you know what I'm saying? Like, it <laughs> yeah. was like very like, we're here for business. Like, there's no walking around, getting your mind off it. It was nuts. So uh, the COVID era was nuts too for that. Um, there's a lot, there's... A saying that I remember from my days promoting MMA that a lot of fighters make it to the UFC, mm. but not a lot of fighters can stay in the UFC. Have you given that thought as to you know how long do you, are you looking to stay in the UFC? Like, is this is this your career that you're looking to stay in as long as humanly possible? And then on top of that, um, you know, being a great fighter is one thing. Mm. But being a great fighter that makes a lot of money is another thing, <laughs> yes. right? Like you, you look at the the fighters that sell the big pay per views. Not necessarily the best fighters. You know, you mm-hmm. look at somebody like Conor McGregor, who at one point was the best at yeah. one forty five and one fifty five. But certainly, I don't think you could say that anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what? What are your thoughts on like making it? You know, focusing on a long career in the UFC, and then. How are you going to make the money, Joe? Yeah. You got to make the money somehow. How are you going to yeah. get people's yeah. attention? And that's the thing is like, uh, you know, I, I, people didn't like when Dana White said that, like, this isn't a career, this is an opportunity. But it really is because there's no, mm-hmm. like, I mean, other than other pro sports, but, you know, with those you have long-term, you know, benefits and stuff sure. like that that you can really, uh, you know, you play a couple of years, you're good to go if you're not foolish. And, uh, you know, this really is an opportunity. Uh, and then, again, I'm going to mention uh, Kraus, but he's a kind of public enemy number one right now. But he said it too. He was like, I've been in the UFC for, I think it was like 15 or 20 fights. He's like, I've never had a day where I felt job security, you know? Right. And I was like, man, okay. Because you always think like, if I can just get to this amount of fights, then I'm in the good graces. And, but you're never. You're always two away or three away from right. being cut. Right. So, yeah, you're exactly right. Um, I mean, shit, they cut Francis and Ganu. Yeah, who's exactly. The number one heavyweight in the world. I always say that. You're one. You're not even one loss. You're one tweet they don't like. You know, like, like yeah. Uh, so, it, yeah, uh, you can't rely on that. Um, I do think at a certain point in your career, you can cross a threshold to where you've gotten enough, you know, credentials and right. wins at a high level to where you go, okay, I am definitely a fighter in the big leagues, no matter what, where like, mm-hmm. if you did have a mi- couple mishaps in the UFC, maybe someone else would pick you up or something like that. But yeah, I think it's exactly, yeah. Uh, I would do this. If my body hold, held up, I was saying that the other day, um, I could see myself doing this for as long as, as possible. You know, mm-hmm. I really enjoy it. And like I just said with the promoting the grappling, I was like, okay, I realize now that anything I do is going to be stressful because it's just how I do things. So I might as well be stressing about this because fighting is just awesome, mm-hmm. you know? I love the grind. I love the training. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think realistically, I'm 29. I'll be 30 this year. I think a six to seven year stretch would be amazing, you know, God willing. But uh, it's impossible to say. Yes, yeah, so you have to start thinking about that ahead of time. I always try to treat every fight like it's going to be my last fight because like that's going to be the last paycheck I ever get from fighting because that's that's how it's got to be. Mm-hmm. So every fight, even when it was like – 
you know, my very first contract, which everybody knows the starter contract is like very, very small, um, is like, I've got to take something and put it into something that can then become something, you know? So, uh, you know, the, the time off between the, the Jared Gordon loss and the, uh, last fight I had in June before this one, I was like, I bought the mats for the tournament. And I was like, okay. Like, and people are like, oh, you can just order and, and finance and this and that. I'm like, not in my business because we don't have a paycheck. You know, <laughs> right. you, you have, you know, you have this amount, like you go, you go buy them, you know? Um, so I drove to like Asheville with a U-Haul and picked them up and they were like used and this and that. But, uh, yeah, I think it's trying to get into other, other endeavors that don't take away from fighting. The big thing that you always see happen is people get into stuff and then it distracts them. And that's the problem where you mm -hmm. go, okay, well now fighting is your main course. And now you're not, you're so full from the other stuff. You don't even have room to, to eat your dinner, you know, and that, right. that's what it can never be. So, um, I, I you know, I've, I've been around guys that have done a good job, like, uh, John Salter here in town, mm -hmm. my coach, training partner, friend, um, he runs the gym. He's ran a program forever, you know, and uh, has always trained and competed at a high level, you know, and uh, has done a good job of making it a priority to train hard and have the right training partners and building it around that mentality um, while also serving the new white belts and stuff. So coaching is definitely something I, I definitely want to do, mm -hmm. even if it's not, uh, you know, even if today I got cut and had to go get a job nine to five, I would still want to be in the gym coaching some kind of fighters or just even the new white belt learning their first arm bar. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've never not been on the mat, so I wouldn't know what to do with myself. But yeah, I definitely see myself coaching one day. Um, and, you know, I really, as much as I was messing around saying it's super stressful, I, I enjoy the promoting aspect. So right. I can see myself wanting to do something like that. And uh, as much as it can be like a, a, a sleazy industry, I feel like being on the fighter side, I also wouldn't mind helping guys out down the line when I maybe I'm retired. You, you talk about that management. a little bit, a sleazy industry. Cause, yeah. So um, a lot of people might not know this about me, but back in the day, I ran a professional MMA promotion with my brother. It was called Art of Fighting. Um, and we tried to do everything, you know, mm -hmm. above board, good to go. But we did run into those characters that, you know, would lie or they wouldn't show up on fight day or they would miss weight or... Um, there'd be these managers that wanted to get their people in and yep. there's all sorts of stuff, but maybe, maybe talk about like maybe the, the underbelly of MMA. Like what, what's yeah. that like? I don't even think I know a 10th of it because we're out here in, in North Carolina, you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of it takes place in the heart of it in like, you know, California, Las Vegas, maybe Florida. Uh, but yeah, I mean, dude, there, it, it, and just the names and faces change, whether it's the character at the local regional show. Even just like the old Amy show, there's always that guy trying to take advantage of young fighters, you know, or <laughs> or trying to, you know, and you have to know that like a promoter is going to be telling you that you're going to smash this guy. It's an easy fight. But if you think for one second, he's not telling your opponent that right. you gotta get that out of your mind, you know, and, and it's always been like that. Uh, even when I was so I was at a fight uh, right after I got signed in New Jersey. I was at my first like UFC since I had been signed. I, I went up and, and visited family and stuff. We went and watched the fights. And a promoter from an organization I fought for came over and said, congratulations. It was like two weeks after I got signed. We always knew and blah, blah, blah. And then he walked away and I was there with my, my manager at the time. And he's like, yeah, just so you know, he was texting me opponents on Contender Series fight day for when you lost, who you come back and fight at their promotion. <laughs> and I was like, gosh, like, dude, like that's terrible. Like you're sitting there yeah. being like, we always knew, we knew, never a doubt, you know? Uh, and then that same manager had actually, when I, we were, you know, kind of parting ways, I had said something about, uh, you know, just some different things. And he's like, well, who got you the contender series? And I was like, yeah, I know. I really appreciate that. He's like, when Sean Shelby called and he asked about you and he said, is this guy ready? I told him you probably weren't and could use more time, but you would probably show up on game day. And I was like, that's terrible. Like <laughs> me and my wife were completely dead broke. Like we needed right. that opportunity. Right. You told him we might not be ready. Like that was... Like you just told me everything I need to know. Like so, it's uh they're, they're always do you, around. Do you, you know? use one of the bigger management firms? Now? Yeah, right like now I'm with uh, I'm with uh, Iridium, Jason House. Okay, so he's got like I, I don't know if under the current roster or overall, but he uh, you know over time, but I think he has a hundred UFC fighters on, wow. on his roster. So he's a, he's a busy guy, and uh, but that's important. You know, it's important mm -hmm. to have somebody that that the UFC respects and knows, and you know can have those hard conversations if you need them, if you're injured or you know. Right. So. Uh, yeah, it's super important, but uh, and he's always done right by me. But uh, it's tough, man. You always see it, even at the regional show, uh, the ticket minimums. I don't know if you guys did that in your contracts on your fight, but uh, where you have to sell X amount of tickets, right. and then if you don't meet that agreement, we're taking it out of your purse. So I've I've made oh, okay. you know seven hundred and fifty to show and seven hundred and fifty to win, and paid 
you know, 350 back to them because I didn't sell my my 25 tickets. Yeah. You're like, man, you're stealing from the from the it's the opposite <laughs> of Robin Hood. You're stealing from the poor. We to give to the we wealthy. Didn't, we didn't do that. We didn't take money away from the fighters, yeah. but we would say, you know, here's a bunch of tickets. Yeah, please sell them. You know, sell exactly. sell them. You get X amount of, of yep. the cut of those tickets. So I had uh, the exact opposite. It was until you sell these, you can't get a percentage. Oh, that's funny. And then if you don't sell these, <laughs> we're taking awful. that out of your purse. Yeah, you yeah, should yeah. not sign up for that. And I am appreciative of that promotion that, that gave me a shot because, I mean, I really think yeah. fighting there helped me. But uh, it's very difficult it sucks. to get people if, – if you're – the fight promotion is not named UFC. Mm. It's extremely difficult to get to sell tickets. It's very difficult. And in fact, you're almost 100% relying on people that happen to know the fighters. Yep. Um, so, I mean, I, I get that. But yeah, if you're a fighter, don't you, you got stuff <laughs> you, to focus on. You shouldn't be out there trying to sell tickets. I mean, yep. have somebody else do that, man. you know, and you know, tickets and t shirts. And <laughs> man, I've been selling t shirts. An hour before the fight, you know, yeah, or tickets or texting somebody, got to meet them downstairs. Thank God for my wife because she's always helped out with that. But uh, that's, that's a part of the game that people don't understand, the hustle. It's a hustle, man, especially on the – even now. I mean, you know, it's always a hustle, but especially on like when you're starting out. Mm -hmm. Like guys don't see these guys, man. You're paying to fight as an amateur, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. I got a guy here in town, Juan Lopez. He's fighting April 1st, so that'll be – two Saturdays from now mm -hmm. in town and in, in, in Ogden. And, uh, man, like it's an amateur fight. He's got to get his medicals. He's got to get, you know, his licensing and, and then he's got to get his corners. You're it's $50 a corner. You know, you're like, man, if you want a, a full staff of coaches there, you're already out 150 bucks, you know? Right. Uh, well, I'll, I'll say right here, I'm not going to make him pay mine. So <laughs> while, while I'm <laughs> listening, but, uh, you're good on that part. So a hundred bucks, but, uh, it sucks, man. It's tough for these guys. Like you're not making any of your money back till, you're taking a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a big, big risk, you know, mm -hmm. and you're hoping you're going to make it on the back end. So crazy. And if, and if you're, and if you're good and you stick with the program, maybe one day you can be like Joe Selecki and make <laughs> it in the UFC. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what, what are your thoughts on the current, just the slate of fighters in the UFC in the lightweight division? How, I mean, how often are you looking at those top 15 guys and saying, yeah, I could probably take him. <laughs> yeah. It's one of those things that I'm a fan. So I watch almost everything, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. I'll have to probably stop that as time goes on if I keep going up the <laughs> rankings. But uh, yeah, I mean, it depends on how you're watching it. If I'm watching as a fan and you're watching with all the production and stuff, something about those lights makes these guys look a lot better than they are sometimes. You know, right. um, when you when you look at it for what it is, then I'll watch and go, man, I think I could get that guy. I really think I could. Or, you know, I'll always say this. If we train in the same gym and I had to spar him tomorrow, I think I'd give him good work. I'd give as good as I'd get, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that with with most of the the 55 roster. And they probably believe that with me. But that's the crazy part about 155. I think 135 similar is the top 50, I feel like, can beat anybody on every, any given day. Mm. Like there is no easy fight. Um, so that's one of the biggest things. But yeah, I, I watch it I watch it a lot, but I'm not really too focused on that. I, I just, you know, we we're talking about longevity. I want to be here. I want to be left. I want to be like, mm -hmm. I wouldn't mind being the guy that when they go, uh, you know, Sean Shelby, we need to match Joe Selecki. He's like, He's not cut. You're like, no, he hasn't <laughs> lost in five years. You're like, oh man, okay, let's get him a big fight. Like, because then you're just you're sitting down there, you're getting wins, and you're you're getting through contracts. You know, so mm -hmm. of course you want the big fights. You want to test yourself, but it's all a test. You know, I had a guy last fight that was signed to fight me from a regional show. You know, right. it was not an easier fight than I'm going to have against somebody else in the UFC. So uh, it doesn't really matter to me. I love to compete. So as long as it's a high level guy across the cage, we might as well, you know, kind of stay incognito, which. Apparently for me, isn't very hard anyway. <laughs> I've got six fights and I walked into the equipment room on fight week and they were like, are you a coach? And I was like, you need your bag? I was like, no, they told me to come try on my fight shorts. You know, like, so, it, it, you know, I think it's better that way. It's one of those, look at Jim Miller, man. He's still there. He's right. still kicking 41 fights. Right. I, I don't even want to know what he's getting paid to show and to win. It's got to be fantastic, you know, and that's mm -hmm. how you just, that's how you create a, a nice life for your family, which is way more important to me than having a million Instagram followers, you know? So mm -hmm. probably way better for you too. Cause I mean, Jim Miller can go to the grocery store and Conor <laughs> McGregor's punching people in bars, you know? So yeah. I well, think, I think it's better off being the the slow burn, you know? Mm -hmm. um, well, let's, let's look at the, the lightweight division right now. You have number one is Islam Makachev. Mm. Um, what are your, what are your thoughts on him? He's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's amazing. Now, the nice thing about those guys is they're so dominant, but they don't want to fight too long. So it's kind of nice because you go, okay. <laughs> you know he's going to be out of the sport. You go, you know, God willing, by the time I get there, he won't even be there. You know, you say, what is he saying? I'm on a couple defenses and I'm gone. You're like, perfect. 
But uh, yeah, un un unbelievable. You know, I, I missed the Volk fight. I'm so mad I missed it. Mm -hmm. But I thought I was fighting the next Saturday. So I was like, oh, I can't stay up till 2 a.m. Right. watching this. Uh, I still have to watch it back because I love Volk. He's one of my favorites. And uh, But I heard it was just, you know, a really great display by both. Yeah, it was it was it was a solid fight. Um, if I'm looking at this this top five, I'm looking at Michael Chandler, Benil Dariush, Justin Gaethje, Dustin mm. Poirier, Charles Oliveira. Any of those guys you think you think you'd like to? Yeah, I mean, I, I dude, I would love to. to I would, yeah. Well, I mean, you want to fight the best, you know what I mean? So, uh, you've got to look at all of it and say, yeah. If I said no. They should cut me right now, you know. Like most of them have fights coming up. Yeah, so I'm, to... I'm a fan of a lot of them, but like it's like it's like Chandler. Like Chandler is definitely a better athlete than me. He probably has more power, but there's a lot of gaps in his skill set. He gets hit a lot. Right. He got choked out by Dustin Poirier. And I have, it was after a crazy war, but right. at the same time, I go, I know for a fact I got to have better grappling and jiu-jitsu than Dustin Poirier. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, and, so, and even with Dustin, like Dustin will go to war with people, but then he mm -hmm. fights somebody that he can't keep up in the grappling and it's not even a, a contest, you know? Right. So, uh, well, that's one of my, that's one of my all time favorite fighters, you know, I'm just calling it what it is. Uh, there's definitely guys you can contend with. And even Dariush, like, uh, he's again, I gotta stop having favorite fighters at 155, <laughs> but I think cause I knew that was my weight class coming up. I always root for them. Uh, one of my absolute favorites is Dariush and same thing. It's like, he's fantastic, but mm -hmm. I've watched, you know, teammates fight him and stuff and, 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 and it'd be competitive till it's not, or, you know, uh, you know, I think he's, he's been hurt in fights. He's lost to guys that weren't ranked, he lost to Alex Hernandez. So mm -hmm. man, I think anybody that has the skill to be in the UFC and stay here a couple fights can, can take out any of those guys. I think that's why you're seeing them kind of have that, mm -hmm. you know, what's Poirier called a fashion show. Like, and he, I, he's actually part of it, even though he hates the, the showmanship, but he'll be like, I'm not fighting Dariush. It's like, well, you can't just sit on the top of the mountain spot right. and tell a guy who's earned it. No, like mm -hmm. it's a meritocracy or it should be, you know? So uh, they know what they're doing. I think, you know, Gaethje fighting uh, Fazeev is is big because mm -hmm. he's putting his spot on the line against a guy that I'm he knows. To watch that one. Yeah, it's, it's going to be, because that guy's been creeping up. He's like uh, Clubber mm -hmm. Lang and Rod, like just waiting <laughs> and waiting and waiting. And and finally they had to, they had to give him one. And now we're going to see, but uh it's going to be really telling if we see him come out and just run through Gaethje. You're like, mm -hmm. top five is not necessarily the actual five best, maybe. Maybe it's like three of the best right. and the other two don't belong there. So we'll yeah, see. The, the rankings are kind of finicky, right? And it's goofy. almost like the judging. Like the judging, too, yep. in my opinion. It's somebody's opinion. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's, it's totally finicky. Um, but, you, I mean, you got some you got some great wins going up. You have, I mean, you have great named fighters that you, you have um, wins over. That's awesome. And now you're starting to get to the point where this top 15 is probably like likely for you in the near future. Um, how cognizant are you of the fact that one, people are now watching a lot of, a lot of tape on you. Mm, yeah. That body triangle is nasty. Yeah. They have to be practicing against this, right? Yeah. yeah for I think sure. I watched uh, just four of your recent fights. There's you got that body, body triangle <laughs> on everybody standing <laughs> on the ground, on the back. It doesn't matter. You're, you're getting that triangle. Yep. Um, how, how cognizant are, of you are you, of how you have to evolve your game to kind of counteract what people are watching and seeing on video? Yeah. Or is there stuff they haven't seen because you haven't had a chance to demonstrate it yet? Yeah, both of those. You know, mm -hmm. I, I I don't want to be a specialist. I actually just kind of despise specialists. <laughs> yeah, I think right. it's disrespectful to the sport of mixed martial arts. You know, mm -hmm. I like watching them. It's amazing. But there's nothing more frustrating. Like, I love Damian Maya because I'm a jiu-jitsu guy and I always mm -hmm. root for him. Yeah. But there's nothing more frustrating than the fights that either he's super competitive or he gets blown out. You know, I think that's right. almost disrespectful to the sport, you know. Um, it's it's so frustrating. Like, how can he be so good and not put that same effort into something else? Um, so for, you know, I've been fighting for uh, 2015, so eight years. Uh, for eight years, my focus has been on stand-up and wrestling, you know. Um, now, the wrestling has shown because that kind of leads into the jiu-jitsu, but mm -hmm. only a couple times have I had to stand and, 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 and we go. You know, it's kind of that in case of emergency break glass. But... Uh, I'm fine with that. You know, I don't care about the opinion, but I know I'm, I'm much more well-rounded than I've shown and than I started as. And I'm okay. As long as I'm getting mm -hmm. better, I'm fine. Um, you know, I, I always go to these these practices and sparring sessions with guys that are supposed to be higher credentialed than me in, in stand-up and stuff, and I, I do very, very well, you know. So, um, you know, even in the De Silva fight, was it became a, a scrap. It wasn't as much of a – it wasn't a technical kickboxing or Muay Thai mm -hmm. fight. Maybe we were both tired in the third, but – 
I got the better of him, you know? So I, I'll take that. You know, that's a, that's a Muay Thai guy from Brazil mm-hmm. who had, you know, I could take down a fence. So I couldn't get him down the third. So it's like, all right, I guess we're here now and we're going to, we're going to go. And even with Jared Gordon, I know he fancies himself a boxer. Um, he won the third round in our fight on the judges scorecards because of two takedown attempts, you know? Yeah. And that's what even the, the commentators, oh man, like, it's like he's got to want to shoot, I'm sure. And Jared shoots on me like, no, I was putting pressure on. I was landing. So whenever, um, whenever I really want to get my true opinion on a fight, I'll watch it without the commentary because I think those yep. the, the commentary will sway your opinion one way or the 100%. other. 100%. And uh, the other thing is they're seating. They're, they're next to the cage That's like right. the judges are. You can't see a lot of stuff. Like even cornering, you're like behind the pole. You're trying yeah. to – it's tough. So I've watched it back and I'll land two shots and that guy will land something – you know, maybe 30 seconds later, and they only saw that. You're like, well, maybe they, yeah. like, that's not, like, well, how is this happening? Are the judges seeing this? Um, yeah, so that's that's a fact. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I'm aware, and I, I, the less we can show, the better. You know, if you watch certain stuff, like uh, I fought Austin Hubbard, and the same thing happened in my last fight. Those guys wanted to stay on the feet. Uh, Austin Hubbard ended up shooting in on me, and the last guy ended up, where he wanted to pressure me, ended up backing up, putting his back to the cage because he didn't like what he felt, you know? Um, the same thing happened. Landed a good shot. Commentators did mention at that time, but, you know, uh, I would say not checked out, but took away their hope of having the heavy, heavy advantage on the feet. Mm-hmm. So when you get them down, they're not fighting as hard to survive, I right. feel like, you know. Um, Hubbard lifted his chin. You know, I got right underneath. This guy, you know, hand fought a little more, mm-hmm. but you could feel it went from game and dangerous to just game. I'm just here, but I'm not I'm not going to try to take you out. Um, now, where I made that mistake in Jared Gordon fight was I loaded up on a big hook. We fell into each other, and we ended up grappling. So he never felt any right. threat on the feet. I truly believe that gave him that hope to stay in there and fight it off. Let me get back on my feet and try again next round. You know, mm-hmm. so uh, I think I, I think the stand up won the last fight because it was just one that one left hook, right? right? But he's a left hook guy. I even said to my coach, "I'm like, we can trade left hooks." That got there. He backed up, and then that was the beginning of the end. You know, so. Right. Um, but if you watch that, you're not going to see that. You know, a lot of people won't see that. So that's fine. I'm fine with that. For the body triangle, the funniest thing is a student at Salty Dog called me out the other night. They're like, every time you teach back control, you say you're not a big fan of the body triangle. <laughs> You'd rather go two hooks or feet. And they're like, but every time I see you fight, you go body triangle. I was like, yeah, yeah I do that. I was like, I was like, that's got to be nerves and adrenaline just holding on for dear life. I don't want them to get out. I'm like, but you should do the hooks. Don't do body triangle. <laughs> <laughs> is that something that you practice a lot, that triangle? Or is it just... I mean, it sounds like you just kind of it just kind of fall into it, like oh, it's there, yeah. so you take it. I'll yeah. do it in training, yeah. but uh, I do a lot of back attacks. You know, mm-hmm. um, when I was like in my teens, uh, Marcelo Garcia, you know, world renowned mm-hmm. jiu-jitsu practitioner, one of the greatest of all time. He, I remember him saying it was kind of like the John Danaher thing. Now that people say like, oh, why ignore fifty percent of the body? But he would say like the back, it's one half of the person. Like if I can put enough pressure, they're going to show me their back. So I used to be like a lay on my back, look for like triangles, work from guard the whole time. And, uh, that really changed. And he was short like I am. So I was like, man, I love how he grapples. So, uh, it wasn't as much pressure. It was more, I'd always work getting to the back. And then now with MMA and punches and stuff, it became more of a pressure, make them turn. But, Mm -hmm. uh, man, for, for 15 years, I've been working on trying to get to the back. So whether it's body triangle hooks, all that stuff, but, uh, back control has been a staple Mm -hmm. for sure, for sure. And a long, for a long time. Well, that's cool. Um, it's one thing uh, for sure sticks out is when you when you get them in that position, you just see the the air go out of <laughs> they're just done. So that's good. Um, what we look at uh, kind of where you're at right now. You've had a chance to be in the UFC. You've worked with Dana White, all these big names, Joe Rogan and uh, Bruce Buffer, and all that stuff. What's what's that experience like? just kind of being in the mix, you know, yeah. like not, you know, you, you're probably past the point of being like in all of these people and all that good stuff that you grew up watching. You know, what's that, what's that experience like just being like, okay, this is my job now. This is where I'm at. I'm in the mix now. Yeah. It's weird. Cause like, I don't feel like I'm in the mix ever, <laughs> you know? So like, uh, especially the first couple, you're like, Joe, you're like, in the mix. Yeah. Yeah. It's like one of those things, like you remember it when you're in the cage, you know, but, uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's one of those things. Like, I, I think I'll always kind of feel like that. Like, mm-hmm. I, I could be main eventing a pay per view, and I think I'd be like, "All right, this is not <laughs> like like they're just doing this because somebody told them they should throw me a bone," you know. But uh, yeah, it definitely becomes a little more normal because you're like, "Yeah, this is what we do." Like, it is fun seeing 
uh, your corners and stuff, you know, like not my corner, yeah. like my, I have my coaches, but like every now and then you get to bring a training partner that maybe it's their first UFC event. Oh, that's like, cool. Their eyes are wide and you're like, yeah, man, this is, this is, this is the perks of the, uh, of the work. You right. know, we get to come out here and be with these guys and this and that, but it really is. It, it, it becomes, I think I also was, you know, the first fight I had in the UFC, the contender series, we were on this crazy adventure, my wife and I, and then, you know, during COVID, uh, we had our first child. Mm -hmm. So I think that was when it shifted from like, I love this just as much. I appreciate it just as much. It's just as exciting. But the bottom line is work, you know, like mm -hmm. we've got to get here and get this done. So like, if it means not sightseeing or this, like, I don't even get to like my first debut when we went, or my only debut at the UFC, my wife and I stayed, we explored the town afterward and for days and days. And now it's very much more like, all right, get mm -hmm. in, get this done. Get and I'm going to get home and see my, my family, right. you know? So, um, yeah, it's just become a lot more work focused because it, it's hard to digest it, Vegas when you have kids at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I don't, I don't do anything. I don't. I've never had a drink in my life. Uh, never touched a drug. Like I don't have the money. Really, to gamble. you've never drank in your whole no, life. No, not my whole life. Uh, wow. Yeah, my coach growing up, John Hassett, who I actually went home and, and saw when we were at Ring Combat last week. Uh, he made a decision when he was a kid to not do so. Mm -hmm. I'm not really even sure why. And uh, he coached me my whole life, and he kind of challenged the kids' class one day. And I was the only person, I guess, that listened, or maybe maybe some other ones did. I don't know, but uh, he's, and I just did it. And then people always ask, like, "Oh, like this and that." Like, if you've never, I'm like, "No, never." Like, I just he said, "I bet well, none of you can do that." And I was like, "Okay, right, challenge accepted." You know, and I wanted to be like him. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, Vegas is a weird place for me. I don't have the money to gamble. So, uh, <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, it's one of those things where you're like, yeah, "It's fun, it's cool," but like, I'm ready to get home. Like, I'm a homebody. Mm -hmm. I'm like a simple, simple person. So, uh, it's cool, but the fight is. I always say that is like. And that's what's really changed, I think, from the the contender series and my debut, and it made, it made my first couple fights was like, the fight is has become the reward for me. I used to be so nervous of the fight and the adrenaline. What if my legs get tired? What if we get in a scrap? And now I'm like, I hope I hope all that happens. I'm like, the fight is the fun part, you know. And mm -hmm. it never used to be like that. I think really it was just having my daughter was like, and now we're having a son, so that's where I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know, I had to get the job done and bring home a paycheck and all of that. But now with the son, I'm like all my fights are going to kind of say something to him, like about being like a man, like, how am I going to do this? Like, am I going to go out there and be, if I get tired, am I going to get cautious and back up and let him see on camera one day that I kind of cower to this guy? No, I'm going to go get this guy, you know? So, uh, just a big shift, you know, the fight is the reward and the rest is for everybody else to enjoy. You know, if there's an after party, someone can go to it and get my name at the door, but I don't <laughs> want to be there. You know, I don't, you, you, you talked a little bit about, um, what we used to call in the military as embracing the suck, you know, <laughs> yeah. you, know you get, you, you, you talked about your legs getting tired and, you know, you're worrying about that stuff. Um, how much of that goes through your head when you get punched in the face or something? Is it, do you have the mentality of bring it on? Like, yes, let's do this. Or is it shit? I made yeah. a mistake. You know, it I used to be the, the latter, you know, cause, <laughs> cause when you're, especially starting out, I wasn't equipped, right? Like yeah. I had this ground game and not really a way to get it there. This is like early pro fights and all my amateur fights. And although in training I could hack you on the feet, it takes years. I mean, you know, it takes years of practicing something for it to show up when it's actually time to, to put mm -hmm. it out there, you know? So, um, yeah, I was ill-equipped. So I was definitely like, oh crap, if I got hit or something. Um, now, night and day, you know, now you're like, yeah, you're going to get hit. You're, you jumped in a pool, you're going to get wet. Like it was, right. you know, but it didn't used to, that, that thought never really registered before. But now even like, you know, in fighting, you don't really feel it when you're in the cage mm -hmm. too much. Um, but even sparring, yeah, we, now we just go like, uh, my main training partner, which is hilarious. Cause he's a really good fighter. Like if he had the time to string together the fights, he could be beating a lot of guys in the UFC. His name's Zach DeLeon and, uh, he's an attorney. <laughs> So all through law school, he's getting done studying eight hours, coming in, and he's sparring, you know, me and John Salter. Now he trains up at Jim O in Charlotte, so he's sparring guys in the UFC all the time. He's great. But, uh, yeah, now it's like, come on. Like, because now we know each other's game. He, you know, I know how hard he hits. Doesn't, he, doesn't every gym have that guy have like that? that? Guy. Yep. That's just, he'll just destroy everybody in the gym, but yep. either doesn't fight or doesn't show up. Sometimes yeah. they'll, yeah, they'll yeah, fight yeah. and they just, they yep. can't fight. So Zach fought. He had a couple of boxing matches. Yeah. He won them all. And he had an amateur fight, and he made this guy – and the guy was pretty good. He made this guy look like he didn't belong fighting ever again. Right. Yeah. So he's, he shows up. That's, I think that's the part that he probably struggles with every day. And every time I see him, I'm like, no, you're an attorney. Go make a good living. <laughs> like, don't do this. But I will tell everybody how good you are. But, uh, yeah, when we spar now, it's like 
my, my one buddy that came up from our gym here, he hadn't been there for a lot of the camp. He came up, was watching. We were, uh, it was cage round. So it's like, it's like a fight on Fridays. And he hit me with something. I hit him and I gave him like one of these or a no and like kind of shrugged at him. And then I missed on him and he was like, and my buddy's like, were you guys mad at each other? I'm like, oh no, we were just enjoying the heck out of that. He got done. He's like, I love that man. It's so much fun. <laughs> we're, we know. And I'm like, yeah, like it's become that, but it never used to be like that. It used to be like yeah. heart in your throat. Like, oh my gosh, what am I about to, to get hit with? You know? So it's been a process, but uh, I really, really enjoy all of it now so much. Like, and then you see guys too, it's not to be long winded, but like even like Holtzman's last camp, like he knew it was the last fight he was having. Mm-hmm. He wasn't being forced out. He had decided this is the last one. Like, so hearing him say like, man, like this air nine workout's about to suck, but this is the last time I'll ever get to do this. This weight cut's going to suck, but I'll never get to do this again. I'll never get to be in the heat of the heat of the right. mix with the boys. And I got to be, I got to go back into being a normal person. You're like, oh man, like I will never take that for granted. Like I'll try to, you know? Yeah. Um, well, that's good not to not to take it for granted because it'll be over before you know it, it dude, one way or the other, right? Eight years has flown by. <laughs> it's crazy. Crazy. Um, what, so the last UFC card, I believe there was three fighters from Wilmington, mm-hmm. North Carolina on there. Wilmington, North Carolina, the entire population of yeah. our whole area is maybe 200,000 yep. people in the whole area. That's that's including other counties, yeah. you know? What is it about Wilmington? Why are there so many UFC fighters <laughs> in Wilmington? You have Derek Brunson, you, Jamie Pickett. I'm probably missing some. You yeah, mentioned John Salter, Salter fought who, for the world title uh, against Musasi and Bellator. Yeah, yeah, so you have a, a big Bellator name too. Yep, and he fought in the UFC too, I, yeah. so What is it about Wilmington, North Carolina? I mean, <sighs> it's it seems odd yeah. that you'd have such a concentration. I, I lived in Myrtle Beach for – I moved there in 2012 and we left in 2018, so six years. And uh, I didn't really know much about Wilmington. I drove my wife to mm-hmm. the airport here once because uh, she was going on a trip. And that was, that was my experience with Wilmington. It was like 4 a.m. So I didn't really – I was so tired. I didn't even really think about it. But uh, so jo- for me, John came and taught a seminar at the gym mm-hmm. I was training at. And I really – a couple of years prior, I'd had a jiu- jiu-jitsu instructor who didn't know a ton about MMA. And uh, it ended up being one of those, you know, classic horror stories of you talk about a sleazy industry. Coaching can be too. Mm-hmm. Um, so we got out of that and I was training at an MMA gym and they had a jiu-jitsu black belt there, but I was definitely the most superior jiu-jitsu guy there. Now he uh, had good MMA experience and was super helpful in putting it all together. It was, it was great coaching, but I had never learned any jiu-jitsu for like the last three years I was down there. I was like, man, this kind of stinks. Like that's my A game. And, uh, we didn't have wrestling coaching. So, uh, John came down and I had, I had been, at uh, UFC 118. So John fought Dan Miller. And uh, at that time, he was like seven months of fighting. And it's mm-hmm. crazy that he made it so far that quickly. And I was like, wait, that wrestling guy is teaching a jiu-jitsu seminar? Like, I didn't know he qualified for ADCC. Wow. He had one, like, yeah. he, he's a great black belt. I had no idea. So it was mandatory to take the seminar. So I took the seminar and was like, man, I just learned a ton. This guy's a good teacher, this and that. Uh, just talked to him just briefly. And then right after that, uh, we didn't really, he didn't, I didn't introduce myself. And I just took a picture with him. I'm like, oh, thanks so much. I learned a lot. And then a couple of people had said to him also like, oh, you went to Myrtle Beach. Did you meet that Joe Slikey guy? And he's like, oh, I keep hearing that name. I don't really understand. And then I hit him up uh, after using the techniques he showed. And I was like, hey, I've been hitting those techniques all week. Like, thank you. He's like, oh, if you ever want to come train. So then I just started coming. And then once a week became, I was working pretty much a full-time job and training morning, afternoon, night mm-hmm. in between. Uh, once a week became twice a week, became three times a week, became like, okay, like, this is insane. I'm spending all my money in gas. Uh, bought my wife down. We looked at the town. We're like, okay, mm-hmm. seems seems like a good fit. Uh, but at that time, Jamie had been coming from Duplin County, so he drives away to get right. here. And uh, obviously, Derek had his thing going on in town, and and they were training together some. So it was like, okay, we don't have a uh, you know a Kill Cliff Sanford MMA where there's a hundred high level fighters, but there's enough where we can learn a lot, you know. So uh, and what John had done was like build a culture. It reminded me very much of like a boxing camp where it was like built around what we needed, you know? So mm-hmm. uh, like you talked about, having those partners that maybe nobody's ever heard of, but they're the right guys, you know, having the coaching right. that was in place. So uh, it was a huge help. We moved here uh, in 2018, March 20 or uh, April 2018. So coming on five years ago and uh, it's been spectacular. Yeah, it was great because I had never been around anybody that was uh, successful fighting MMA. I had right. been around the guys that maybe got their shot and failed. And it's kind of like a cautionary tale. Mm -hmm. And it puts a really negative stigma around MMA. You go, oh, man, so this is going to be my life. I'm going to go. I'm going to try. And if it doesn't work out, I'm going to be teaching private lessons and working a day job for the rest of my life, regretting that trying, you know? Mm -hmm. John was the first person I met where I'm like, oh, you 
you have a great life. Like you live in a nice house. You have a nice normal life. You can go out to eat. You don't have to, right. you know, it was, it was awesome. So, uh, yeah, that was great. And that was the move here. And now, you know, we just love, we love it here. It's, uh, it's been awesome. The gym's grown and, uh, you know, there's MMA events here now. Derek's got his card coming up, mm -hmm. uh, April 1st. And it's really become a little hub. The amateurs, there's tons of amateurs, there's tons of, you know, pros starting out. So it's, it's, uh, it sparked something nice in, inside of, you know, what's John been here? Maybe seven years. So mm -hmm. I've been here five. So, uh, just seeing it grow has been pretty cool. Yeah, that's really neat. Uh, it's really cool when when you're watching the UFC as a fan to be like, hey, this guy is yeah, from Wilmington. A, a relatively small Wilmington. town, you know? Yeah, he trains out of Wilmington. So it's it's really neat to see that. Um, what are your thoughts on on that? Also on that card was John Jones. Yeah. The John Jones fight. Uh, what what are your thoughts on John Jones as a human and John <laughs> Jones as a, as a fighter? And, and I'll give you my opinion real quick. Yeah, 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 please. John Jones is my favorite fighter of all time. <laughs> okay. Okay. Forget the out of the cage stuff. Sure, the guy is the, the you know a disaster outside <laughs> outside of the so cage. So are a lot of them. But I yeah. think you got to be a little crazy to be to be doing what you guys are doing. Um, but the way he fights is why he's he's my favorite fighter of all time. If you watch a lot of his, a lot of his wins over the years, he goes right after the strength of his opponents. Mm -hmm. You looked at like when he fought Charles. You mentioned Charles Sonnen. When he yeah. fought Charles Sonnen, what did he do? He, he took him down. Him. Yeah, exactly. When, when he fights. Um, Daniel Cormier, he'll wrestle with him. Why are you wrestling with Daniel Cormier? You know, yeah. like the way he fights, it's it's that mental game that I love about MMA. It's it's the the fact that he's going after your strength, and once you defeat someone's strength, that's it. Yeah. They have nothing. Yep. You're like, oh, this guy just he beat breaks me. guys. He yeah, beat me in my own game. Yep. So that's why he's my favorite fighter of all time. But what what are your thoughts of him uh, at heavyweight? Yeah. Um, it looked like to me, it looked like he did go to his strengths. Because, yeah, yeah. because Cyril Gaon is obviously a great stand-up fighter, and uh, it looks like he went to his strengths. He went he went to the wrestling there. So I, I don't I don't know if he's flipped the switch on what he's doing yeah. or if he's like, ah, oh, these guys hit harder at heavyweight. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. I mean, I think I think he's extremely intelligent inside that cage. You know, I'm not a fan of the antics, so I don't really. I right. would say I like watching him perform. It's like Anderson Silva. I couldn't stand Anderson Silva as a personality i didn't like all the antics and right, the showboating right. and kind of the fake humility that caught up to him eventually yeah you know oh, yeah. chris weidman got yep. a hold of him another teammate of ours yeah, yeah he's fantastic uh but yeah it was like one of those things where you got to be able to appreciate the greatness like you're not going to not wa watch when he fights um right. yeah i think i think john's gonna do great at heavyweight i think uh he's just too well-rounded he even at that weight it looks like he moves well still he's still got good mm -hmm. conditioning and all that so uh i think it's gonna be great but yeah i think he fights up to his competition. So it seems like when he gets that fight that he's like, I'm not really intrigued by Dominic Reyes. I'm not intrigued by Santos, you know, mm -hmm. or even the OSP. I think it's just, yeah, like when he gets the ones he can get excited for, like DC. And I mean, you can't deny that that's one of the greatest we've ever seen inside of there. So right. uh, it's amazing to see. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and he breaks guys, like you said, at what they do. Like he's not the wrestler Daniel Cormier is, but I feel like because of his fight IQ, he finds a way, you know, maybe he can't double leg him, but he'll foot sweep him or he'll, mm -hmm. he'll do something to mess with him where, he makes him real human. I am super excited to watch him and Miocic, though. Yeah. If oh, Father yeah. Time hasn't caught up, but uh, because Stipe is deceptive too. He took down DC. Yeah. Like he's another guy that just kind of finds a way. And if you can't neutralize him with power, which I don't think John's John can, that could be a fun fight. Like that could be like a very good like back and forth fight. So I'm excited yeah. for that. I'm excited to watch that as well. Uh, I haven't seen Stipe fight, fight in a while. Was he, when was mm -hmm. the last? Fight? I think it was. Uh, <laughs> it seems like it's been a minute. The Francis loss. Oh, okay. That was a while ago. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wonder if they'll. I feel like there's too much money on the table to not talk to Francis and Ganu and get him back uh, in the UFC. Think. I saw yesterday he's close to signing with like PFL or, or one. He said, yeah, but he's well, going to box first. So the, I mean, the thing that I like about the UFC is it's really prevented what's happening to boxing. Mm -hmm. Like boxing is 100 percent reliant on which fighter wants to fight which fighter. It's just yep. silly. They go through this whole thing where they go, you know, these guys go 20 and 0 before they fight anybody. They're fighting complete. Tomato cans, yeah, literally. Which is, if you never heard that saying, it's, it's a fun one in MMA. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> it's just ridiculous. So the UFC has provided like, no, we're gonna make, we we make the matches. You're gonna yeah. fight the best people. I love that about the UFC. Yeah, um, as a fan, especially, you're like, this right. is what I want to see. Like, I don't want to see John Jones get three warm up fights before, mm -hmm. and then the other guy loses one that he shouldn't have lost, and now they don't see the fight. You know, I I don't want to see Canelo Alvarez versus. Somebody else round eight, right? Yep. Eight, the eighth, 
It's, or, you know, or Floyd and Manny <laughs> seven years past when everybody right. wanted to see it. You're like, like well, yeah, he, he was a guy that relied on pace and his chin, and both are kind of mm-hmm. slowed down. Like, what are you doing? That's what the UFC always brings. The, the best fighters, when they're on the top of their game, yep. you, get, you get to see that fight. Yep. So I, lo- I love that of, about the UFC. Um, we talked about John Jones. Somebody else I want to talk about because there's a possibility here. Yeah. You could fight Conor McGregor. <laughs> I wish. Right? At lightweight, look, he's coming back. Who's yeah. he, who's he fighting? He's got a Chandler. Yeah. Okay, he's fight. Oh, he's fighting Chandler. Yeah. Okay. Well, allegedly, allegedly, right? Like you saw it first. Yeah. <laughs> he's got to get back in the testing pool for oh, six man, months. He looks yeah. big, doesn't he? You know, he's not in the testing pool, so he's got to get in the testing pool for six months before he okay. can fight. I'm sure they can make an exception, but that's the rule. Allegedly, not, you know, maybe you'll fight Jake Gyllenhaal. Like, yeah. <laughs> God damn, he looked huge. Uh, he's not passing any USADA test. No, no, no. no. Uh, what are your thoughts on Conor McGregor as a fighter? It's crazy because I have a hard time separating the the person from the athlete. I'm right, right. I, even some a little kid like and it's very judgmental. I shouldn't do that, you know. But also some things he does is flat out wrong. Um, I loved Conor McGregor. Like when he was mm-hmm. starting out, I was like, man, I draw so much inspiration from this guy. He was confident, a little arrogant, but he wasn't a bad. He wasn't doing bad things, you know. Right. Um, and then when he jumped the shark, I was like, I'm out. Like I'm rooting for anybody that fights Conor McGregor. But, uh, I just think we were talking about it. Uh, what was I talking about it with yesterday? I can't remember. We're talking about how a guy just loses that confidence and they can't get it back. And it really Mm -hmm. seems like that's where he's at. Like I used to watch his interviews over and over and over again and like the documentaries and all that stuff. And he, I really felt like from the outside looking in, he believed what he was saying. And now I watched him on Ariel Hawani's yesterday and I looked at my wife. I'm like, remember when we used to watch all those interviews and stuff? Like, he's just a guy saying something like a movie script. Like, oh, I, I be- believe me, I'm coming back for everything. And I was like, you're just another guy in the mix now. Like, I, I really think he's still a very good fighter, but I think he's very, very beatable by most of the top 15. You know, I, I, mm-hmm. I don't know who I'd pick him over in the top 15. I mean, there's guys for sure. Chandler's probably one of them because he gets touched a lot, you know. But uh, I'd like to see him fight Gaethje. I would love to see him fight Gaethje. (laughs) I'd like to see Gaethje fight anybody, really. I'd like to see him fight Benil Dariush. There you go. That's a fight you'll never see because it's the cash cow and the dark horse. Exactly. But uh, I think he's an easier fight for most of these guys than he's not. You know, welterweight. What about Joe Selecki? Is he easy to fight for Joe Selecki? I would take that million dollar payday. (laughs) I don't know that. (laughs) I'll give it a crack. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's the thing is like, he used to be a guy where guys would go, okay, he doesn't wrestle well. His ground game is not fantastic. I don't think that was necessarily all that Mm -hmm. true. You know, like he hung in with Habib. He did good stuff. But now, like when you watch him with Poirier, like, yeah, his wrestling was atrocious. His ground game was atrocious. You know, it looked like somebody's not in the gym every single day anymore. And uh I think there's a lot of young, hungry guys like myself that would be like, uh, yeah, great opportunity. And I think I'm probably going to surpass him pretty here soon in, you know, the overall game. Maybe not in striking ever. He's got a left mm-hmm. hand from, you know. But, yeah, I mean, that would be, that'd be amazing. One of the reasons I brought Conor McGregor up is, one, it's fun to just hear yeah. somebody <laughs> talk shit about him. Um, <laughs> but more so, I think he's really shown the blueprint for how to make money in the sport. You know, um, you're at the point now you, you probably see a lot of the other fighters trying to like grasp for attention somehow, mm-hmm. like get, you know, there's, there's almost two sports happening at the same time. Yeah. There's the, the sport of, uh, trying to grab people's attention as much as possible. And then there's the sport of, oh shit, I got to go and do the real thing, which yep. is go in there and fight. Um, when you're, when you're going against somebody and you're, I imagine these next few fights, this is going to happen sooner or later. Um, and they're just talking shit, yeah, right? They're yeah. talking smack, you know, they're talking about whatever yeah, to, get into, yeah. in, to get into your mind. Um, does anything bother you? And what are, what are your thoughts when you hear these, these people saying these things, knowing one, they're going for the attention, yeah, yeah. right? For themselves. And then, you know, how does that make you, how do you react to those types of things? No, I don't think so. I mean, obviously there's certain things that are off limits, you know, like, like look at Habib, you know, I think he's a guy of great principle, you know, and Mm -hmm. the only things that sent him over the edge out of everything, he got taunted for not drinking, he got taunted for this and for not having Mm -hmm. stand up and all. And the only things that sent him over the edge were his family and his Mm -hmm. faith. And you don't attack that on a man, you know? So I would say those are the only two things that would be crossing the line, you know, and and that's always kind of been silently in the proverbial contract of trash talk, you know, right. and you see guys break these. But other than that, no, even the last fight, 
Um, I guess when my opponent signed, he he made a video saying he signed with the UFC on short notice, and he was like, "Oh, I'm." I, what he ended up saying was like, "Yeah, I signed. I can't wait to smash this dude or something like that." Right. One of our buddies was like, "Man, I can't believe this guy's talking trash." I was like, first of all, don't ever tell me that again. Like, I don't watch this guy's stuff for a reason. <laughs> Second of all, like, I said, "Did he say anything about Casey or Nora?" He's like, "No. Why?" I'm like, "That's the only thing that matters." Like, that would be something that, like, not for show. Like, we'll walk. You know, I'll, I'll talk to you in the casino and we'll have a word over here quietly about how that's not respectful. But aside from that, like, yeah, you're supposed to say you're going to make me look like an easy fight, you know? Sure, whatever. Uh, I don't see any of that ever really bothering me, you know? Um, I also just try not to watch anything with my opponent. It's like, it's a you shape, you know? You don't watch their social medias? And no, all I used to. I used to almost <laughs> too much. Then I, you know, but uh, now it doesn't matter. Like, there's nothing he's going to say that's going to change what I'm going to try to do, and he's like, what am I going to do, try right. harder? Like, my career and livelihood are on the line, like, <laughs> and my family's future. Like, I'm going to try as hard as I can, whether you call me a name or don't, you know? But, but being around some, I imagine a lot of the people you've been around on other cards and things, eventually they're going to end up on the other, in the other corner against you. Yeah. Is yeah. there, are there certain guys you're like, man, I just want to punch that guy in the face, you know? <laughs> I don't think I've seen anybody in my weight class no. like that. I've seen some guys that I don't like, I don't, just because it's such a foreign concept for me, is the guys that need attention. Like, mm -hmm. when no one's even around, like at the weigh-ins, you know, like, uh, <laughs> like the actual weigh-ins or the yeah, like our, ceremonial like, Yeah, ones. like our private ones, like they're carrying around a speaker with their music on it, like, come you, on, you could have just had headphones, like, like, like that stuff drives me <laughs> nuts, but not enough to want to punch somebody in the face, you know, but you're just like, oh, that's annoying, but just because it's such a foreign concept to me, I hate being like the center of attention, um, so, yeah, I mean, I, just, I really can't even imagine a situation other than I can see if you were on like like how Chandler probably is right now. Like you were mm -hmm. trapped alongside Conor McGregor for six or eight weeks filming that show. You probably can't wait to punch him in the face, yes. But like, right. yeah, I, I don't – like even though I think the last fight, the opponent wouldn't shake my hand at the weigh-in. Really? But he said something like – he was like, oh, not till tomorrow. Like he said like not, not till tomorrow. Like I was like, okay, that's fine. Like it doesn't really bother. Like That's that's his process. Yeah, like that's – I was like, okay, that's like – that's fine. Like whatever you got to do to – you got to tell me that you, you got to tell yourself you hate me. To, I don't have to tell myself I hate you to be you. You're just a shape. You know what I mean? Like you're just mm -hmm. a person who's five foot eight in front of me who's a good boxer with good submission defense. Okay, cool. Like I don't, I don't you don't even have to have a name. I don't really care. Uh, so I don't see it bothering, but you can never say never, you know, but that's right. where, you know, that's where a good support system comes in. My faith, like, you know, I, I would never want to do anything that would, you know, disgrace the people that support me, but also like I want to make sure – I am being who I say I am, you know? So like one of our uh, friends, and he's a pastor, said, uh, you know, don't seem be. You know, don't seem like you're this outspoken, you know, man of God. Like be a man of God, you know? So like that wouldn't right. really coincide with how I want to live my life, you know? If I'm like, hey, you said you're going to beat me, now I'm going to shove you at the weigh-ins and, and slap you. Like that would probably, you know, do a lot more harm for the people watching than good, you know, maybe for the ratings, but mm -hmm. I'm not out there for that, you know? Well, and my kids got to watch that one day. <laughs> well, with all the social media platforms and things, I think authenticity is a great trait, you know, to just be authentically who you are. And it is what it is, you know, yeah. love it or hate it. Um, Man, if I was doing that, it wouldn't even catch on because it would be so phony because it's so far. Like McGregor really is like that, you know, like like you watch his stuff when he mm -hmm. was uh, uh, not even in the UFC and he was talking like that. That's who he is. He's a flashy guy. If I started coming out being like, He'll be done and one like it would just people be like, this guy's a cheese ball. Like mm -hmm. I can't even I can't even like I can't stand this guy. Um the the this part about the sport that I really enjoy the most is just the mental game. That the what's going on in, in people's heads before, during, and after a fight. Um when you're in there with somebody and and you're thinking about trying, do you ever think about kind of assessing the risk of things that you're going to try. Like, I, I kind of want to do a spinning back to kick yeah. in the head, but maybe I shouldn't. Yeah. You know, if you if you watch the last uh, Valentina Shevchenko fight versus yeah. Alexa Grasso, how many times has she landed that spinning back kick? A, a thousand time. times. Yep. But this one time, she tries it. Yep. Grasso's all over it, takes her back, chokes her out, wins the title. Um, what is What is your thought on, you know, that mental game of, I guess – regulating your own emotions of trying out these risky maneuvers yeah. or I want to try something, you know? Um, well, I think you got to train the way you fight or the way you want to fight, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, but 
Yeah, I don't think there's a lot of time to think, you know? So I Mm -hmm. think that could also be the problem is if you're thinking too much, you know? I've always felt like in sparring and even in fights, when I'm waiting for something to come, it ends up happening. You know, like, I don't want to get hit with that overhand, you know? like, Or I could just get my jab going and busy him and he doesn't have time to throw it, you know? So Mm -hmm. um, I think the big thing is just going, you know? And I I never really had a problem just getting going, you know? Uh, Even in this fight, I ended up on the single leg, and I ended up bringing my opposite knee up and just touching him in the head. It wasn't a very good knee. Right. But our coach leaned over to, to Zach and was like, didn't expect that from old JoJo. Like, where did that come from? But it's just like, you're just going, you know? Yeah. Like, it's something I had done in training, and it, it ended up showing up. So um, I think if you hesitate, you start falling behind. So I try not to really think now on the ground. It's different because you have more time. It's a little slower. It's more isometric. But on the feet, you shouldn't be thinking about much. You know, it's just kind of processing, I would say. Mm-hmm. You're just seeing – and, you know, your subconscious is processing, sorry, and, uh, you know, just just kind of going and, and going off of instinct. And if you train the right way, your instinct should be – but it's live by the sword, die by the sword, right? right. I mean, I have a teammate, Brian Barbarina, who has been in wars, you know, and I don't even think people really care about his record. His record's very good, but, uh, you know, he's had fight of the night so many times. And, you know, somebody was talking yesterday. I was talking with a friend about fights, and he was talking about uh, him versus Luque, and Brian lost that fight. In the last four seconds, he had a decision one. He wouldn't take a step back. He wanted to finish out fight of the night as fight of the night. Mm-hmm. He could have killed five seconds off the clock. He got hit with a knee and went down, and the ref stopped it. He should have let it go. But uh, it didn't matter because on Monday, Brian got to walk in those offices and basically say what he wanted to be paid on his next contract because they're like, man, that was the best performance we've ever seen. You know, right. So uh, you just you just got to go and accept it is what it is. You know, so That's where my faith comes in too is like, I know I have control of how I train and, and you know, showing up and, and doing the right things. But at, at the end of the day on fight day, what's going to be is going to be, you know, and sitting there right. stressing about it, should I throw this right hand is not going to help that at all, you know? So it's just, uh, I think a lot of people are scared of losing, especially the guys that have never lost. But I lost my whole life in jiu-jitsu. I was terrible at jiu-jitsu growing up. I lost so many matches. I lost matches in seven seconds, literally seven mm-hmm. seconds, where you go, and not like shot in and got guillotine, like <laughs> got taken down, got my guard passed, and got submitted with a, a Kimura or a key lock. And you're like, you're not even trying. There's no way you're even trying, you know? Right. So like, I'm not scared to lose. Yeah, it sucks, but I'm not scared to. You know, you get these guys that have been stud wrestlers and midget wrestling, high school wrestling, college. They've never, maybe they've lost two times and it scarred them for life, you know? But like, right. I hate to say I'm a good loser, but I'll bounce back. I'll be all right. You know, these people that are, they're clinging onto it so tight. I almost creates that hesitation. I think yeah. panic. Well, I mean, definitely. Uh, you know, it's sometimes it is good to fail. You know, yeah. it's good to fail because you you learn something. And the fact that you bounce back so many times, it's like okay, I can lose and still move move on, move yeah. forward with with what I'm doing. Um, you mentioned you mentioned something that I did want to talk about. You mentioned the rules. Mm. In my opinion. There's some really dumb rules in the MMA, <laughs> and and the judging is probably worse. Yep. Um, what are your thoughts on judging? Like, what what could change to make it a just a better sport? And then, what are some of the rules that are like? Why do they even exist? You know, what are yeah. kind of those silly rules? I mean, the crazy part is a lot of it just doesn't make sense. Like the twelve to six elbow. Like, what is so is dangerous that still about a thing? that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a uh, you That's can go. John Jones only. Loss yep. is a disqualification. He was pummeling Matt Hamill. <laughs> I saw a uh, hilarious meme about it the other day. I'm not going to say it because it'd be <laughs> in poor taste, but it was really funny uh, about that loss. But uh, yeah, it, uh, like you can do the. You got to show it to me after this. Yeah, <laughs> you can go three to three to nine. They say like so across, and on the ground you can go because it's still three to nine. You just can't go, and it's because of. Those guys on ESPN ate the Ocho breaking bricks all those years right. ago, and it's still a rule, you know. Um, I think the stand-up rule is ridiculous. I think it's foolish. Yeah, I know it makes it more viewer friendly. They were doing that a lot in the in the last card. They were Crazy. breaking up fights. And that, where if you know, somebody had control, and it was like you're breaking them apart. And it's because it's a big pay per view. But if you notice, you haven't seen. I would probably say, if if any, single digits in the last three years, stand-ups in the apex because there's no crowd like that. The right. crowd that's there paid $1,500 a ticket. There's 100 of them, and they're not mm-hmm. booing. You know, right, so right. Uh, that is actually and, – and the fights didn't suffer for it. So just let the fighters fight because if you can't – if you can keep me up, uh, keep me from taking you down, we stay on the feet. If I can keep you down, we should stay on the ground, you know? Right. Uh, now, obviously, I'm biased because I'm, you know, a lifelong grappler, but – it, it does create a whole different dynamic to the fight. 
I can't, the, the I ref's can't. not responsible for entertainment, you know? <laughs> I can't remember which fight it was, but the the ref stood up somebody that had top position on somebody. I think it was a Sun Sal. Okay. Yeah, Every, yeah. Like last weekend or two weekends ago, one of them? It was, it was 285 was the last one that I watched. So I think it, it Maybe was, not. It was some, somewhere on that card. But anyways, the, the fighter had top position, and I guess they weren't making, you know, they weren't advancing, yeah. but come on. <laughs> like, How hard is it to get into the top position to begin with? It's, uh, man, and that's how you know a lot of the refs and judges have never participated. And mm -hmm. that's, I think, the, the cure is more fighters get into it. I loved how Pride scored the fight as a whole, mm -hmm. but I feel like, well, we know they had a lot of fixed fights, but I feel like stateside with all the money involved, it would just be too easy to fix because yeah. you don't have to give a an account for why you're saying, you know, oh, just like you won. You're like, he was controlled the entire time. Well, I said just like you won. There, there it is. You know, you don't have to give a scoring. Well, there's got to be a better solution than what's going on. You, because you mentioned the the fact that the judges are sitting right by the cage, and you, you really can't see everything. Yep. Uh, and you hear the crowd. That Patty fight, perfect example. Yeah. Like, watch that fight with the volume off and tell me Patty, uh, Patty Pimblett won that fight. That's nuts. Right. Not even a chance. Put him in a soundproof booth with, or put the noise-canceling headphones on. I guarantee they see a That's what I'm song. suggesting is they should have – maybe you have three by the cage and then you have another three that are watching it on – yeah. know, Sound, you know, without the commentary, just watching the the fight video. We'll go five, five judges. That would at least, yeah, at least, least it would, it, you would say, okay, I got robbed, but I got robbed by five idiots instead of three, because <laughs> three is just so little. Like you can get one bad egg and it changes it to a, a majority draw, or you know what I mean. I so don't, I don't understand. <laughs> There's always one judge that you're like, what were you watching? Like, yeah. were you even? Paying attention to the same fight. And, and not only are the tra trajectory of the cr guy's careers on the line, but also you're getting half your money. Like, it's that's a big deal. Yeah. That's oh, a big yeah. Deal. And really, the more you go up, right. the more of a bigger deal it is. Like, yes, it hurts the new guy for sure if your contract is 10 and 10. But there's not as big of a difference between 10 and $20,000 as there is if you're Jim Miller and you're getting 150 and 150. Mm -hmm. $150,000 is one thing. $300,000 is a whole right. other animal. You can pay off your house, you know? So, like, <laughs> That, that is life changing. You got to you know, get you can, that right. Yeah, you can ruin someone's life because of your incompetence, and that's they don't treat it with the reverence that I really think it deserves. Like this is right. important stuff, but you know, I don't know that the solution is going to be found anytime soon because it works. It works as a business model, so they don't care. It kind of works. Yeah, I, mean, I think it detracts a lot from the sport. Really, I mean, because I just seen, I've seen so many bad decisions over the years. I'm like, oh, it's crazy. I don't know what's what. What were they watching? And um, even even titles and stuff. You know, like. Again, that's light. Like going into a fight See, is a challenge. I have a different opinion on titles. I think titles, if it goes to the judges' scorecards, you didn't win. <laughs> that's right? funny. It, yeah, it yeah. belongs to the champion. You got to yeah, yeah. beat the champion. That's what everybody says. Um, yeah. But I think about that. Fight, like if if it's like a one sided beating, or even think about like some of Jones's fights. You know, like the yeah. Reyes one. People think he really won. You're like, okay, so now he could have went into a rematch as the champion with pay per view points, a percentage of a of a million sales of pay per view, like. That's life changing. Now he yeah. just goes back in with his regular contract. You're like, man, mm -hmm. it's they don't think about it because they don't know. You know why? Was, why would they? It's ten point must system. It's from boxing. Yeah. Yep. And where there's uh, one thing you got to worry about a punch. You know, like <laughs> it's a lot easier to score. And if if you're in top position, you're gonna get that round ninety nine percent of the time. Even if even if you're not able to advance, you're not really doing any damage, mm -hmm. and the person on the bottom is just relaxing yep and getting catching their breath so i don't i don't i don't know this, there's this a uh, there's a point method online i don't really know the ins and outs but i know it mm -hmm. uses decimals and they always post on their account what they would have scored the fight and all the crazy robberies they've gotten right mm -hmm. and i don't know what is attributed to what but i know it's a lot more intricate than the sys the 10 point must system yeah. i forget what it's called but it's, it's a really they have a lot of followers like, it's a very big deal a lot of high names share it out but i can't remember what it is called but it seems like a Feasible solution. Yeah. Now, what what about cutting weight? Um, I think there's a few promotions that do the hydration testing and mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah, one FC does. Um, or one championship. What are what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, I think there's always going to be a way to beat the test, but I always do feel like when we're in the casino on fight week, you're like, man, I'm 170 or 167 or whatever. He's within a pound or two. We should just go shake hands right now and be like, why don't we just fight at this? We're at our leanest, our strongest, our most peaked. Instead, we're going to take all the fluid out of our brain and body the day before for what? Like, it's mm -hmm. going to diminish the show, really, yeah. you know? Uh, come to training on a Friday at GMO when we're in camp and come watch the sparring. I can spar three guys, Fred. You know, it's not 
it's not great. They're, they're animals. But mm -hmm. I can go through three guys fresh, but in a fight, your legs are tired after one round, you know? So it's one of those things where uh, I think I think you did a 30-day weigh-in, you know, like boxing does sometimes. It kind of limits that water cut, mm -hmm. maybe a couple pounds. Well, tell me about some of the highlights of, <laughs> of your training career coming up uh, into where you're at today. Yeah, growing up. I mean, I started at six. So, uh, man, it was not, there was no highlights. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, we started, I started at a school. I mean, my brother started first. He was playing baseball. And my parents tell the story that they moved towns and town politics. He wasn't getting playing time. They put him in the wrong position. I'm like, okay, translated as he just wasn't good. <laughs> so they wanted to put him in something more individualized. I was four. I wanted to be a Power Ranger, the good ones, not the oh, 19th generation. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, I want to do martial arts. It's like, well, you're four. You're not doing anything until you go to school, you know? So they put him in. They didn't want to do karate. So they put him in karate, but it's 97 when he starts. Um, by the time 99 rolls around, that instructor had been doing jiu-jitsu in Philadelphia. So we were in South Jersey over the bridge. Um, started traveling into Philly, found jiu-jitsu by accident, got his blue belt. 99, a blue belt, means you could teach. So he started... By the time I started, he switched the entire school over to jiu-jitsu. So just a freak. I would call it accident growing up for the longest time. Now I call it God's hand in my life. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it was like one of those things where you're like, that, that's crazy. Um, we end up leaving that school to go train with the guy that – they were they were teammates in karate, but my lifelong instructor ended up becoming this guy's kind of mentor instructor in jiu-jitsu because uh, they ended up kind of – the school got real small and ended up kind of closing or switching back to karate. So we switched to uh, – trained under, under this guy, John Hassett, who we had known since we were six. He would come to all of our events at the school as kind of like the senior member of the affiliation or whatever. And my parents were always like, oh, if, if he ever comes closer, because he lived and had a school far away, he came closer. So we signed up. Um, to this day, still my instructor who I go up, I see him, you know, all the time in New Jersey. He's the guy that put the black belt on my waist. Um, but it was just like a, a passion. I was terrible. I have stuff in my eighth grade yearbook from kids writing, you know, sarcastically, good luck starting your jujitsu school, good luck fighting, <laughs> you know, like being, being jerks. Do, um, do you use that as motivation? I used to. It's a low level yeah. motivator. Now I use all the good stuff. I look, you know, my daughter, <laughs> my wife, my faith, but, uh, yeah. Oh, for sure. It got me through a lot, but, uh, I find that spite is actually a pretty good motivation. Yeah. Right? It runs out in fighting. <laughs> it runs out after a while, yeah. you know, cause then like what happens when, like, if that was the case, then after my UFC debut, I would just stop fighting, you know? So right, it's like, right. okay, that was actually kind of when I made the switch. And I'm like, okay. And that was perfect timing where it was like, okay, now I have a daughter on the way. Like, I have all these reasons to fight for instead of against. Mm -hmm. But yeah, oh, it was definitely that. It was like this, like, sprint away from all the naysayers to go prove them wrong for a long time. Um, and then, you know, I was always, I loved to compete for some reason, but I also hated it. Like, I would get nervous. So we would do a tournament once a year, pretty much, was about it, because they were so expensive. Um, and it was in the summer, it was in Wildwood, New Jersey. But the thing was, we would go down the shore every weekend in the summer. So every weekend we would pass exit four, which was the exit for Wildwood. Our exit was zero. And at four, my stomach would drop. I would get like sick to my stomach and would start asking if we could pull over so I go to the bathroom. And they'd be like, well, it's four more miles. We're not doing that. So like I would torture myself. I don't even know why I enjoyed it. And then I got really, I got beat up every single time pretty much. So I read this quote a couple of years ago. It said, rejection breeds obsession. So I was thinking that's probably why I got like so hooked on mm -hmm. competing. Um, my instructor would just tell me, man, it's it's fine. Like one day it'll catch up. Your brain, your body, you'll click. And uh, around 17, it did. So then by by then, I, I, I kept the spreadsheet of all my matches from like, not as a little kid, but like 07 on. And uh, if you watch the record at the end of every year, it's like, oh, you know, six and 10, seven and seven. 42 and 10, you're like, oh man, like what happened? You know, and then then it was like, okay, 18 grappling black belts, you know, adults that are winning big things. Right. Um, and it seemed like, you know, it was just uh finally starting to click. Then we moved down south. There's no jiu-jitsu in Myrtle Beach at the time. There's like very low level jiu-jitsu, right. but there's MMA. So I'm doing jiu-jitsu and grappling. Probably do some on the boardwalk if you go down yeah, there past yeah. midnight. Yo, you go down there right <laughs> now. Yeah, for sure. Uh if you're willing to get that close. But uh yeah, and they were doing MMA down there. I'm like, well, I don't want to fight. I don't know, my parents don't really want me to fight. And uh, I'm going to school and doing all this stuff. And then just some things happened. And I met my wife and we kind of, you know, got in a bind. And fighting made the most sense. They had a local fight coming up in seven weeks. And in Myrtle Beach, there's no sports or anything. So actually- Wait, hold on a second. I love this. I love this. So, so you, when you say you got in a bind, like you had no money- Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, Financial or bind and school money. hadn't gone too well. I was training too much and my GPA went down. And uh, so you take the fight 
yeah, I'm like, I'll, I'll stay in school and this and that. And then I ended up uh, in that process was like trying to work at a warehouse full time and go to school and train and then school. So the thought in your head though, wasn't necessarily, I want to make a career out of this. It's just, well, I'll make a few bucks. Is that what? I always wanted to be in the UFC. And then I put that dream on the back burner. I was trying to do the right thing by everybody that wanted me to do the right thing. You know, <laughs> fighting's a risky career and you know, no, no, sure. nobody wants to see their kid get hit or their friend. Uh, right. So I was trying to do the right thing. And then circumstance had it where it was like, but I mean, I sat my wife down on the second date and told her this is what I wanted to do. You know, for a long time, I put it off and was like, oh, I'm just going to be a, I'm going to try to be a world champion in jujitsu, you know? But all I would do is even at 20, 21, I was like almost playing make believe that it was fight camp, you know, instead mm -hmm. of a jujitsu match. So uh, it all kind of unfolded the way it was supposed to, I guess. And uh, there was a fight in seven weeks and Myrtle Beach fighters back then, the, the event warfare was actually pretty big there. So guys would make tons of ticket money mm -hmm. and they would get good sponsors. So yeah. they make a couple, I ended up making like two, three thousand dollars. Like, all right, I can do wow. this every couple months. We'll be all right for a while. That was the last local event they had in Myrtle Beach for like two <laughs> or three years. So uh, after that, I, I ended up fighting on seven weeks notice. I got a crash course in MMA. You know, I had done some sparring here and there, but nothing good. And uh I have the first pad session on video. It was atrocious. I still have it. Um, and then I had to take the show on the road. I'm like, okay, now it was a race to get to the UFC. Like how fast can we mm -hmm. go? So I did uh, five amateur fights in like nine months. And then- what, Isn't there a rule of how many amateur fights In, you in South do? Carolina, you did. Yeah, you had to have five and an 80% win rate. Uh, my rule of thumb was like, if I lose one of these, I'm probably just going to stop because like I should, be able to, <laughs> I should be able to beat. If I can't win amateur fights, I definitely can't go to the UFC, right. you know? Um, so then I went pro in, uh, October, 2016. So a year later and had six fights in like 14 months. Like we just went, wow. we were just going. Yeah. Wow. Um, and then I lost, you know, uh, lost one it was three and oh, mm -hmm. lost one came back, had to kind of humble myself. So I was fighting in Atlantic city in Philadelphia, mm -hmm, CFFC, mm -hmm. big promotion came back, fought in Myrtle beach. I kind of had to humble myself. Cause when we left, I was like, I'm never fighting here again. Like this is low level. I'm, I'm, I'm going to these bigger regional shows and they want to have me after I lost. So I came back to Myrtle beach. Um, one, one went back up North, one, another one moved here, uh, after going to the UFC in Charlotte and being like, we, we were talking about, when you see it on TV, it's a little different when you see it in person. I looked at my wife, I'm like, I can do this. Like we can do this. She's like, yeah, I know. I'm like, we're moving. So we moved to Wilmington. Uh, I lose the first fight here, end up putting two together contender series. And then the rest was kind of where we're at now, you know, strung all these UFC ones mm -hmm. together and that's the short version. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, uh. Man, it was, it was a ride. It was a wild ride. We, we always laugh. We're like, it's like walking through, a, I don't know. It'd be like closing your eyes and driving through, you know, four lane traffic. And then you get there and you look back, you're like, holy crap, there was cars <laughs> wasn't by. We were almost dead five times. You're like, yep. So uh, it was a wild ride for sure. Um, you brief, briefly mentioned on our little break that you uh, grappled Donald Cerrone. What was that like? Yeah, so that's what I was kind of, we were talking about like, you know, exposure and stuff. And I was like, man, for the longest time, I was, I, I don't want to be this like big household name where like, I don't want anybody, like, I don't want the eyes on me, you know, it's just, but financially you always want to get those big breaks. So I was like, always like, all right, this is the one I'm going to beat Jim Miller. And that's the one that's going to put me over the edge and get people's respect or this and that. All right. I'm going to, that's the grappling match with Cerrone. And I was like, all right, like if I can get this done, this is going to double my Instagram following. I'm going <laughs> to, you know, get paid more. I'm going to this, that, the other thing, <laughs> the entire match, all Paul Felder did in the commentary was talk about how good of a grappler Cerrone was. I'm on his back and he's going, see, this is what I trained with Cerrone. This is what <laughs> Cerrone does to people. You're like, guys, I got my arm around his neck. Right, he's right, tapping. Right, right. Like, um, and then the Yahoo news article was Donald Cerrone choked out in grappling match. And I was like, man, <laughs> didn't put your name. No, nope, nope. Nope. And I was like, man, like, so I like, uh, like the next Monday I was home and I was running and I was like, man, like I was thinking about all this stuff where I never get my due. I felt like this and that it really, you know, obviously I'm faith driven. So I go, I feel like this is just God trying to tell me this is not my way. Like it's not meant for me, you know, this overnight notoriety. So like yeah. I, I was thinking about, it, I was like, man, like I never get my, my notoriety. And like, it felt like a counter shot back to me, like that mm -hmm. thought of like, well, maybe it's not meant for you. And I was like, man, yeah. Cause that was the one that's, the, I mean, that guy's in movies. He's the, so yeah, famous, yeah. The, you know, the, the truth is, you know, there's, it's very few people that have this overnight success. Mm -hmm. Usually it's overnight success, 19 years in the making. Exactly. So, somebody I think about when we talk about this topic is Kevin Hart. Yes. You know, he was a stand-up comedian for, I think, 19 years before yep. he started doing movies. Well, that's the like thing. That. Is in my mind, I'm like, I'm paying my dues. I'm beating good guys in fights. Like, right. this is the one that'll get me that fight. Maybe I leverage it into an MMA fight with Cerrone or, or something, you know. Right, right, right. Uh, and just nothing kind of came of it. They were like, okay. 
And then even when the next grappling event rolled around, they offered me less pay against a tougher opponent. I was like, wait a minute. Like, oh, because I beat the guy he wanted to win. Like, oh, I get it. Like, this is how this works. So, uh, yeah, it was just funny. You know, it was like, it was a, but it also rekindled everything for me. I was coming off the Jared Gordon loss and I was very, like I said, like a very like work, work, work mindset. This is a job. And on that trip, it was the exact opposite. It was like old school being 15 years old again, sneaking off to go to a tournament in another state and not telling my parents, you know, right. um, that's the only thing I had, I didn't drink or anything, but, uh, I would drive me and my two buddies that trained that were younger than me. So I'm 17 at the time. They're, uh, 16 and 15 and I'm the only one that can drive. You're only allowed to have one person in New Jersey that's not, uh, that's not family in the car. That was our big thing. We snuck off to Virginia to go compete. Oh, such bad kids. But uh, it felt like that because I took my wife, my daughter. It was back home. I had John Hass and my lifelong coach was in my mm -hmm. corner. Um, and it was like, oh, yeah, like I love this stuff. I do it for nothing, you know? So mm -hmm. it was the – what I what the intended effect of taking that match was and what came out of it was night and day. It was like, oh, yeah, I got to have my daughter on the mat, get that picture after the win. You know, it was, it was huge. So uh, it worked. It just wasn't what I thought it was going to be, you know? So, so all you news people out there – you need to start printing the guy's name in your articles. Joe Selecki, <laughs> he's the one that beat Donald Cerrone in a grappling match. Probably could beat a whole lot of people in, gra in <laughs> any grappling match. Um, speaking of kind of like getting your name out there and stuff like that, uh, what do you think about Joe Rogan's, uh, you know, have you had any interactions with him? No, you know, you know cause the, the crazy part is during COVID they were the one that I, the one that I won, the first one I won in COVID, uh, they were doing the interview through like, the camera. Oh, okay. so, so they weren't in the cage. <laughs> and I think it was John Anik. Maybe it was DC that, that, that did the mm -hmm. interview. I think it was John Anik. And then the next fight, I beat Miller, and they cut to a commercial break. So I never got an interview. <laughs> uh, and then the wow. next fight, I lost. And then the the Silva fight, I also didn't get an interview. I think we were the last prelims. They were switching off to the main card. They're mm -hmm. like, all right, get in the back. Get out of here. Uh, to no interview. And then this last one was Michael Bisping. So I never, I've never been on a pay-per-view. I've never gotten to be, uh, would you be interested in <laughs> flying out to Austin, Texas to be on the Joe Rogan? Heck yeah. I'd be interested in that. Hey, to talk fighting for three hours. That'd be hey, awesome. Hey, Joe Rogan, you're, you're much better at talking about mixed martial arts than me. You know, why don't you hit up Joe Selecki <laughs> here on Instagram and see if he'll come do your podcast because yeah. he's great. First of all, he's fun to talk to. He loves the sport right. and I think he'll be a great guest for you. So we'll get We'll get that sent out to him and, and over to That him. might be that moment that you're talking about yeah. where you're like, do you ever get around these things? And you're like, holy cow. I'd be like, okay, this is uh, this is my life now. <laughs> I used to listen to Rogan in the cafeteria in college. Mm -hmm. So I didn't go for the college experience. I lived at home. My parents moved to Myrtle Beach as well, or Paulie's Island, but south of Myrtle mm -hmm. Beach. And uh, I would sit there with my headphones in. I would only train, go to the minimum required classes I had to to, to keep good grades and go eat and go home and train again. And I didn't do any of So I would sit there. It was like worse than high school. I'd sit there with nobody and I would just be downloading. Because this is like yeah. 2012. You had to download Back it to your iPod. YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would download <laughs> it to my iPod and just listen and listen and listen. I'm like, yeah, I have friends at college. It's Joe Rogan and Eddie Bravo or whoever was on, right. you know? Crazy. Uh, I think that's funny that you've had how many fights now in the UFC? Uh, six. Six yeah. UFC fights, and you haven't you haven't had a the, uh, and three post fight interviews or one two post fight interview with <laughs> Joe Rogan yet, which will happen. Your next yeah. your next ten wins will all be, uh, be main nice. event with Joe Rogan uh, giving you the the rundown. Uh, I thought that was funny that last fight where they threw the the hat on his oh head. Oh my gosh, dude! <laughs> the memes out of that was the Kazakhstani. Too. Hat, yeah, yeah. He's such a good sport with all that though. It's so funny. Uh, is he's an interesting personality. Yep. Um, just just in general because he, he hits so many different areas. Um, and then obviously as a longtime UFC person, have you had any interactions with Dana White? No. You know, what's crazy is okay. uh, I was on the contender series. So he was there, you know. That was my assumption that I thought, that's why I, it's literally called Dana White's contender series. Exactly. But I, I guess I have, but they've yeah. been through the cage, you know. So okay. like uh, he's sitting there, him and the matchmakers, and then I won mm -hmm. and I said something. Um, oh, I told him I could do that to, I could do that to anybody in this division right now when I yeah. put the guy to sleep uh, on the contender series. I was like, anybody not in the top 15, I'll do that to you right now. And I think the top 15 in a year, I'll take them, you know? And, uh, he nodded and was like, he, yeah. I didn't realize, I guess he said like, you're in, I didn't notice that. So wow. I was all nervous waiting right, for them right. to make the decision. And then obviously whatever he said when, uh, 
whenever he was giving his little, mm -hmm. you know, speech about I was in the UFC. So, uh, but then when we go, he was giving an interview and then he went this way and then we're all coming up to do our interview. So I never got to like shake his hand or anything. I met him once at CFFC when I was fighting my third pro fight. Mm -hmm. They were filming looking for a fight. I knew I wouldn't get signed with three fights, but uh, right. I went and took a picture and I told him I was going to work for him one day. And then I posted it with that caption. Like, dude, I look back on some of this stuff. I'm like, you're so bold. Like what, what happened <laughs> to that guy? Like that guy just blindly believed, you know? Uh, and then sure enough, but, uh, and then after the Hubbard fight, I, uh, I choked him out standing and I was like, Hey, Dana, I got a baby on the way. Like I did something like this, something like that. Yeah. Like, I got a baby on the way. Like I need that bonus. I didn't get the bonus, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, those are my only interactions with him. Man, what's the guy got to do to get a bonus around yeah. here? The last one, I got to do it dramatically. You got to put him to sleep, I guess. Yeah. Hubbard tap. So I didn't get it. We were standing up though. I thought I would. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite fight of all time? Man, it doesn't need to be UFC either. It could be any, yeah, any yeah, yeah. boxing, whatever. I think Daniel LaRusso. Yeah. No. <laughs> well, on our podcast, uh, we did the favorite fight was in one of our episodes. And we what, both what's the what's the podcast? Uh, name Touching on? Gloves. Yeah. Touching Gloves. Check but, it out. Uh, me and our one co-host, Caleb, like our big UFC fans, we had like our UFC fights picked out. I think we each had mm -hmm. three. <laughs> and our 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 uh you know, I won't call him main co-host, but he definitely our MC and co-host, Kevin. Had like Frank Dukes from Bloodsport. I'm like, you ruined it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, honestly, it, it's changed. I used to love like, uh, you know, Frankie Edgar, Gray Maynard was great and this and that. Mm -hmm. But as a fighter, I think the one I draw the most inspiration from, and I was watching it the other day, is uh, Poirier, Max Holloway. Like, I, I just great feel fight. like I really great relate fight. to Poirier. Yeah. I really look up to him. I think he's a guy that hasn't changed with all the success. He just seemed very down to earth with his wife, his mm -hmm. family. And uh, he gets a new tattoo every fight though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, yeah. He's covered. <laughs> Do you got I'm tattoos? Not, I got a, a ba I'm finishing up this sleeve. because I right. get some shading done, but uh, I've got that. And then I've got uh, my, I got a Rocky Balboa tattoo because we're from right over the bridge in Philadelphia. So I have an unhealthy Rocky obsession on my bicep. That was my first one. Have you one. seen the new Creed movie? It's a long story. No, we've got home. We've been so busy. All I want to do is see this movie. All I want to do is see this movie. Like, yeah. that's what I told my wife. I'm like, I don't care about eating bad food. I just want to see this movie. She's like, oh, I want to too. Cause she's like me. She's, she's a big fight fan. She loves Rocky. Yeah. Um, I, I saw it. So, so it was it, good. It's, it's a great movie. Yep. But there, but Sylvester Stallone's on it. I know. And there's definitely scenes where it's like, it's missing. He should be there. Yep. Like either, this is 100%. But in line with this I want to see it. Oh, We're going to see it this week. So movie. we had a bunch coming up. I got back. I had to travel to Atlantic City this time. I'm like, oh, I want to do. So when we were in Atlantic City, it was playing in their IMAX theater in the hotel. <laughs> and I look at my buddy. I'm, he's a huge Rocky fan. My buddy, Matt. I go, we got to go see this. Like if there's a downtime and Tom mm -hmm. doesn't need us for anything, we are going to see this movie. Yeah. And there was no downtime. But, uh, and then this week, you know, we're like, if we get a sitter, it's my five-year wedding anniversary today. So I'm like, mm -hmm. I can't, while we both love Creed, we can't go see Creed. We have to go to a dinner or something, you know? That's the other tattoo I have on my wedding ring. We got it done in Mexico uh, above a souvenir shop with no sign or anything. And I was like, again, we had a picture with the tattoo artist. He spoke no English. I'm like, what were we thinking? Like, we just get in these situations. But uh, yeah, Poirier, Max Holloway. Uh, I think because it's just kind of like poetic the way it played out. Like he goes out there, he's crushing them, almost gets finished in third. And he, mm -hmm. you know, comes back and puts on a great fight. And then the interview and stuff afterward was like, it was a, a war for the ages, but he's talking. He's just, again, that candid personality where you can relate, where he's like, mm -hmm. man, like it was slipping away from me in the third, man. But I had to tell myself, don't talk to yourself like that. Like then dedicates right. the fight to his wife. Like I would like to think and say that in that exact same situation, it's the exact same thing I do. You know, it's like, right acknowledge the fact that these are the people that got me here, my wife first and foremost, you know, so uh, for what it stood for, but also it's just a heck of a fight. I mean, I love watching him fight because you hear those punches. Uh, you don't, and not everybody that punches in that, in that cage, you hear like that. You hear the smack from his shots mm -hmm. and uh, man, that's fun. That's fun there, to watch. There's something too. some, some guys just crack, isn't it? it, it it's almost just genetic. Yep. Um, so I mentioned we, we used to do the promotion. We had Seth Petrozelli. Yeah. Um, the first fight after he beat Kimbo, he fought, he fought with us in Tampa, and he beat this guy Chris Baton almost the same way. Yeah, he beat Kimbo like right away. <laughs> and um, when he was hitting the mitts in the back, I was walking through the back, and I could just hear this yep. thud like boom, <laughs> boom, like I'd never heard before. <laughs> yep. Some and Seth, just got Seth is a fantastic striker, but I've never just like hearing him hit the mitts. I'm like, wow, this is this is someone that has been doing this their whole yep. life. And some guys just. Uh, yeah. My coach, Jeff Jimmo, calls it, like, they just got magic. Yeah. We got a guy on our team, 
<laughs> who's only been fighting for a year up in Charlotte and uh, George. And he's like, George just has magic. Like, yeah. like he, he hits the mitts good. He trains good. Yeah, he spars good. But like, it's not until he let lo- he's let loose in the cage and can let him go where you're like, oh yeah, he's going to like, it's a no brainer. He's going to be something great. You know, he's just got magic. Uh, another kid, Paul has magic more in the wrestling and the grappling. You're like, okay, trained him my whole life. You wrestled in college. Yeah, you're great. But like, I can't move you. I get your neck. I can't choke you. Like, you just have magic. You just got it. You know, some guys just got it. And then. What is that? It's I don't like know, something man. In the ether. It's That's what like, makes yeah. fighting so crazy is like, yeah. you can be, have all these credentials, but he's got it. Like yeah, the X yeah. factor. I don't even know what the <laughs> X factor is, but he's got it, you know? And you meet those guys and you almost know from the beginning. And the nice part is when they don't know, like these guys, Paul and uh, George, you're like, they don't even know they got it and they got it. Like, that's what's going to take them far, you know? Yeah, it's 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 something, but it was really cool to um, watch someone like him fight and strike and things like that. Um, we're fortunate to have some awesome some awesome fights. We had yeah. like Marceo Pitipano Cruz had a bunch of fights Dude, with us. A legend, and a just, legend, jiu-jitsu legend. Yeah, yeah. Submitted um, a guy in the finals of Pan Am's with neon belly, a position <laughs> like, and that was the cover of the VHS that year. The guy was like, "I'll never get submitted with." He, I think he does double knee on the belly. And the guy goes, "I'll never get submitted with that." And the the, the poster was him neon belly. Like, how do you something with neon belly, dude? That's crazy. Yeah. Shout out to Pede Pano. I a think legend. he's still, still down there in Lutz, Florida. Yeah, if you asked with his gym. 100 modern-day jiu-jitsu practitioners and they knew who he was, I'd be surprised if five knew. Him and there was Isn't a guy, uh, jiu-jitsu guy, Margarita, was amazing. And like, mm-hmm. 01, 02, you're like, these guys don't know their history, man. We also had a guy named Delson Heleno. Yeah, oh, us. yeah. Yeah, oh, he followed sure. us a bunch of times. Yeah. And he was, he's, when he followed us, not only was he obviously a fantastic jiu-jitsu guy but man he'd come in just jacked yeah i mean he was yep. uh, you know is there anything to that if you see somebody across <laughs> and, and you're pretty jacked joe don't get me wrong you're jacked <laughs> but if you see somebody and you're like man that dude's freaking shredded is there any part of you that's like that it even matters you know yeah, as an amateur for sure yeah, yeah and then i'd say now it's almost the opposite if a guy's a little softer you're like is this going to be the cardio king like the ben Askren doesn't right. get tired because like right. Uh, even Barbarina I talked about, like he mm-hmm. never fades and he does not look like a professional athlete physique wise. He'll tell right. you that. Like he you never get gets Daniel tired. Yeah, I mean, this I, guy is- yeah. That's, I always say that. Like <laughs> I, I got, cause I'll even be guilty. I'm like, I feel like strong and lean in this camp. And then I go, I know physiques don't win fights. Like, cause it just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Right. I mean, obviously some guys, if they come in like that, maybe they're not doing their work, but some guys just have that predisposition physically where you're like, don't judge a book by its cover. This guy's going to go five rounds and never get tired. You know, I, I absolutely love that. I mean, can I tell you how much I love this? I mean, if, if MMA does anything, it, it tells the truth yep. about what actually, what, what actually works in real life. Yep. Look, every other sport in the yep. world is compared to fighting. Yep. Right. When it comes down to it, the most pure competition is two people fighting to the death, right? That's, exactly. that's the most pure competition. And then as, aside from that, you know, in today's modern era, we have mixed martial arts, yep. right? So it's the most pure competition. Whenever you watch a basketball game, it's always, you know, they the guy, fight hits, each other, the yeah. guy hits a free throw. It's like, Oh, there's the one, two punch. It's yep. like, no, that was a free throw, yep. right? <laughs> this guy wasn't uh, risking anything. Um, I love the fact that MMA, you get to see what actually works and doesn't work yep. in real life. You know, like there's all these, kind of bogus martial arts out there that are they're they're great but i put them in the same category as dance yeah you know like yeah or um, yoga or something like that where there's a right, benefit, right. there's a benefit for sure 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 um uh what's what's the one that uh uh is it aikido yes uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> all wrist <laughs> anderson and silva throws. was doing yeah, he yeah. brought a um seagal steven seagal out with them like yeah it, anything that says like i could show you but i can't do it all the way because i'll kill you you're like that's uh-huh. not true. Oh, you're right, gonna shoot me? Like there's no there's no strike that's gonna kill, you know. I love I love the fact that you get to really see what's true. Uh and let's see if I miss any. To me, in my opinion, as as a fan of the sport, I see wrestling works. Yeah. I yeah. see jujitsu works. Mm-hmm. I see judo works, um, boxing, yep. kickboxing, muay thai. Mm-hmm. That's all I see. Is there yeah. anything I'm missing in there? No, I don't think so. You know what I mean? Like there's variations of each one. People yeah. give it different names, but 100 percent I think those are the that's the base, you know? Mm-hmm. And some work a lot better than others. Like I'd say jiu-jitsu now. The way jiu-jitsu is done modernly, while it's it's fun to watch and this and that, I'd say only like 20% of it works in MMA. You know what I mean? Like you're yeah. not seeing a lot of arm bars and triangles off your back yeah. anymore. Guys are getting wise to it. So we got to grow at the times. Like if smart. you have jiu-jitsu without wrestling, you're going to be up a creek without a paddle, you know? so uh, Or just wrestling without having hands to set it up. Like 
Yeah, that's what people, I, that drives me nuts. And people are like, well, what's your specialty? You're like, I'm in the UFC. I do Why it do all. Why do they still like, do that? Yeah, if it's you very watch archaic. The UFC, they'll say, oh, this guy's a... A boxer, a, yep. It's silly. It's, it's, it's foolish. It's it? MMA now. Maybe back in the day. And yeah. I know everyone... You mentioned this. Someone's going to say, well, what about Loyota Machida? He does karate. Yeah, yeah. And he, he's Wonder obviously... Boy, the exception. A great fighter. And there's probably things you can take from any any art form. Um, but why do they still do this? Yeah, this is it's, silly. It's foolish. It's like... It's it, it MMA. Actually it's its, its own thing. Back. Yeah, like yeah. you need to understand like... The same person, you know, you have, I have a kickboxing coach the way I have a jiu-jitsu coach or a wrestling coach or, or an MMA coach. Like, dude, like, that's so archaic. And then people always say, right. you know what your guy does? You're like, yeah, he does everything. He's a, <laughs> He has 21 pro fights yeah, and, and grappling experience and pro boxing experience and this and that. Like, yeah, he's, he's great everywhere. Like, what are you talking about? Like, But it's just, I guess people think back to 93 still, mm-hmm. which is crazy. It's a young sport. I get it. It, it is young, but it's it's definitely come a long way. I mean, you look at across the globe now, it's... I love the fact that um, you see so many cards now with fighters from different countries, yep. so many different countries. Um, so it's really, it's really come a long ways, and and it's a global sport now. It's a global it's, phenomenon. It's, it's incredible. That's what, even with the fight I was supposed to have. You know, I had a um, last minute replacement. Mm-hmm. Was uh, Benoit Saint Denis is from France. I, was, I thought that was so cool. Mm-hmm. Like he's gonna get on a plane and leave France, and I'm gonna get on a plane and leave North Carolina. We're gonna meet somewhere and hash this out <laughs> and have respect for each other. Like this is the coolest thing. Yeah. Like, I can't think of a cooler job that I'd want, you know? Like, yeah, I was yeah. like, man, like, there's something kind of, uh, you know, noble and poetic about it. You're like, that's pretty cool. Like, he's going to represent his country. I'm going to try to represent mine. Like, that's pretty, pretty, pretty cool, you know? All right, Joe. So, um, let, me, let me ask you this question. Uh, why should people care about watching Joe Selecki fight? Why should, why should we care about watching uh, you know, I don't, I don't know that they should or shouldn't, but I would say, I said this uh, right before the contender series on a podcast here in town, and uh, I think it still applies to this day. It was like, I was like, man, I'm just because if you're like from this area or wherever you're from, but if you're just working a job and trying to take care of your family, like I'm one of you. You know what I mean? Like, I like fights I can relate to. Like, I really can't relate to Conor McGregor anymore. I could on the come up, but I can't right. relate to, you know, getting off my yacht to go to a, a <laughs> private gym in a Versace robe and get my hands wrapped professionally to train, you know? Um, but yeah, cause it's just, it's the same way I would want to watch, you know, a documentary about the military or about, mm-hmm. uh, first responders in New York city or something like that. Like it's, it's, I think it's kind of cool. It's noble and it's, but they're, they're blue collar people, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I think you give me Conor McGregor's money. I'd be a blue collar guy. I'm pretty simple. So <laughs> I think just that, you know, it's just like, uh, people watch fighting to get away from whatever they're going through. And, uh, it's the same thing. I'm fighting to get away from, you know, like that's my, that's your 15 minutes to enjoy and, and relax. And that's mine too. As weird as that sounds, you know, like, uh, I'm just going through it too. It's just, we're all kind of in the same boat. I think the pandemic really showed that with the fighting it was like, everybody all of a sudden loved MMA. It's like, yeah, cause it's real. It's real. This is what we're all going through symbolically right now, being trapped in the house and told you can't go to work or whatever it is. You're like, this is real. You know, you can relate to it. And I think, uh, I always try to just be relatable because I'm just some guy that likes to fight. Like I don't, like I said, I always say this in the back room of fight. Like almost every fight I've said this to my coaches. I'm like, I'm not supposed to be here. Like I was not meant to, I was not supposed to be here, but I'm meant to be here. You know, like mm-hmm. I had to scratch and claw my way to get here. Like it's not a, uh, I didn't have some easy path where from 10 years old, people are like, this guy's going to be a world champion. Like not even, no, like mm-hmm. every fight I've had, I've been counted out even down to coaches telling me as, as much as recently, like, oh, I didn't think you were going to be you know, five and one in the UFC ever, or be able to be in the top 10 or top five. You're like, oh man, like, okay. Like glad you had faith, you know, but it's like one of those things where it's, yeah. just, I'm just a regular dude. I guess I won't give off that impression. I like that. I like when people tell me that it makes me happy. That means I'm, it means I'm not a jerk, you know, or at least not too much. So, uh, yeah, I'm just, well, well, let me tell you why I think people should watch you fight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> one thing is for sure is that you're authentic, right? You're not fake. You're not yeah. one of these fake people out there pretending to be somebody you're not, you know, trying to yeah. just drum up drama and all this stuff. And to me, that's respectful, right? That's a respectful person. You know, you put your faith first, you put your family first. I think a lot of people like that. I think it's something that everyone should follow and pay attention to. And I can't help but just love your enthusiasm for what you're doing. I mean, Man. everybody <laughs> can tune into somebody that's passionate about what they're doing. They love what they're doing. And I think that um, you're definitely somebody who loves what you're doing. Yeah. Oh, man. More than ever. It was, uh, 
you know, this camp was tough because I had to go away. And that was mm-hmm. tough because every day I just wanted to be with my daughter and my wife. But uh, every, gosh, by the end, the last four weeks, every night my daughter would call on the FaceTime <laughs> crying, Daddy, I want you. Oh, man. This is tough. ripping my heart out of my chest. But, uh, you know, it's what we had to do to, to be prepared. But uh, in the actual work, that's what my buddy said after one of the sparring days. He's like, man, almost almost done, almost done. And I was like, yo, other than being home with my family, like there's nowhere else in the world I'd rather be than doing this terrible echo bike workout. Like there's nothing better than that feeling of crushing it, you know, or, or sparring somebody. Like, I don't know that I always felt like that because I was kind of a fish out of water when I first started. But man, I love, love, love what we get to do. It really is. Uh, and it's all going to be gone one day. So that's the thing too is like, Better appreciate it because in fighting, it's very short lived. It could be more. I, I could have an injury that you can't come back from after practice today at wrestling, you know? You never know. So, uh, yeah, I love well, it, man. I absolutely love it. Well, let's hope that doesn't happen. Yeah. Uh, if you're interested in following Joe, I'm going to put all of the links to his social medias in the description of the audio podcast and, of course, on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube while you're there. Uh, leave us a five star review on Apple Podcast and appreciate you tuning in. Joe, thanks for being here. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's a blast. You'll come back, right? Yeah, 100%. All right, we'll do do it again after your next victory. Uh, This is the NDS Show.